Oversight Committee voted to cite Attorney General Janet Reno for contempt of Congress. The vote came as a result of the Attorney General not releasing subpoenaed documents relating to her department's probe of Democratic fundraising during the 1996 presidential campaign. The vote was 24 to 19. To carry the full effect of the law, the measure must be taken up and approved by the full Congress. From today's hearing, you'll first hear from Chairman Dan Burton, then ranking Democrat Henry Waxman. The meeting was three and a half hours. The committee will come to order. Uh, good morning. A quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. The committee is assembled today to consider a contempt of Congress citation against uh, the Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno. I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. In addition, I ask unanimous consent that the committee release the executive session of the Subcommittee on National Economic Growth, National, Natural Resources, and Regulatory Affairs to receive testimony from Marcia Scott on April 1, 1998, without objection so ordered. I will make an opening statement, and then I'll recognize Mr. Waxman for his opening statement. Today, we're meeting for a very serious purpose. We're meeting to decide whether to hold the Attorney General of the United States in contempt of the Congress. I regret very much that we've had to come to this point. I had hoped that we would be able to work out an agreement that would meet the needs of all the members of this committee. And toward that end, I had a conversation with the Attorney General this morning to see if a last-ditch effort would, would eliminate this necessity. Our purpose has never been to hold the Attorney General in contempt. Our purpose has been to get the information that the committee needs and to which it is entitled. Last year, we had a similar impasse with the White House. We could not get documents that we required for our investigation. I had to schedule a meeting to hold the White House counsel, Mr. Ruff, in contempt. It should never have gotten to that point. The White House should have been cooperating from day one, but they would not, so we had to move for contempt. But at that point, we started to make some progress. My staff met with their staff at the White House. They had several long meetings, and they hammered things out. We worked out an agreement, and we avoided having to vote on contempt for Mr. Ruff. Of course, we found out six months later that they hadn't turned over everything that was required, but my point is that we, we did negotiate in good faith and we were able to avoid a showdown. In this situation we're faced with today, we have made no progress whatsoever. The Attorney General has not budged an inch from the position she took last week. She wants to do a partial briefing for only two members of the committee, myself and Mr. Waxman, a month from now. She wants to deny any information whatsoever to the other 42 members of the committee, given the serious nature of what we're looking into, and that's unacceptable. This morning she made uh, another offer, which was also unacceptable, which I presented to our committee members, and that was that we would wait until we came back in September, and in an open forum she would express uh, some of the reasons why Mr. Labella and Mr. Free uh, said there should be an independent counsel. But in an open forum, there's no doubt in any of our minds that the guts of the reasons would not be able to be made available to us. Therefore, that was a non-starter. We issued a subpoena for two documents, a memo prepared by FBI Director Louis Free in November 1997 urging the Attorney General to appoint an independent counsel in the illegal fundraising investigation and a lengthy report prepared by the supervising attorney of the task force who was appointed by Ms. Reno, Charles Labella, again urging an independent counsel. We told the Justice Department that any secret grand jury material could be deleted. The subpoena specifically says that. The attorney general has refused to comply with the committee's subpoena, and that's why we're here today. Let me say a few words about why we need to have these documents. 
Last November, the director of the FBI wrote a memo to the Attorney General, and he urged her to appoint an independent counsel. Last December, he told our committee that he made this recommendation based on both sections of the law, the mandatory and discretionary sections. In other words, he believed that the Attorney General had a conflict of interest and should not be involved in this investigation. And what's more, he believed that the Department had sufficient information about covered persons under the law that the Attorney General was obligated, obligated to apply for an independent counsel. In his testimony on Tuesday, Director Free stated that his memo focused on a core group of individuals that included the President and the Vice President of the United States. I want to repeat exactly what he said about who was in this core group to whom he was referring. I asked this question, does the core group include the President and the Vice President? And after hesitating for a moment, Mr. Free said, yes, sir. As the New York Times reported, his memo stated, it is difficult to imagine a more compelling situation for appointing an independent counsel. Two days ago, Director Free told us, and I quote, I could not think of a stronger argument. How did the Attorney General react? She rejected his advice. In July, the head of the task force, who was appointed by Janet Reno, Conducting this investigation, Charles LaBella sent the Attorney General a 100-page report, or thereabouts, which again urged her to appoint an independent counsel. In his testimony on Tuesday, Mr. LaBella stated that his report focused heavily, heavily, on the mandatory section of the law. In other words, his 100-page report dealt mostly with specific information about possible crimes involving high government officials. We have heard testimony from the top FBI agent involved in this investigation. He told us he agrees completely with Mr. <laughs> LaBella's conclusions. So what did the Attorney General do? She called a meeting of her top advisors to discuss this report on July 21st. Did she invite Mr. Free, the head of the FBI, who wrote his report? No. Did she invite Mr. LaBella, the head of the task force that just made this recommendation? No, as a matter of fact, Mr. LaBella said he didn't even know about it. He was in San Diego. Did she invite Mr. DeSarno, the FBI agent in charge? No. Instead, she invited her political appointees. She hasn't spoken to Director Free or Mr. LaBella about this memo since he gave it to her over two weeks ago. And I might add that Mr. Free, under testimony, during his testimony, stated that he had already reviewed in detail several times Mr. LaBella's memo and the Attorney General who by law has 30 days from the time she gets new information to decide on an independent counsel has said she needs three more weeks and she's already had three. It's, it's, it's inconceivable to me that the Attorney General with all of her supporters up there couldn't go through this document uh, uh, as fast as the director did and he did it within a two-week period. Why would uh, the Attorney General be meeting with her political appointees and not her career professionals who are running the case? That's one of the things that we need to know. Has her refusal to appoint an independent counsel for over 20 months done irreparable damage to this case? That's one of the things we need to know. The three individuals who know the law and the case better than anyone else in the world have told the Attorney General that she has an obligation under the law to appoint an independent counsel, and yet the Attorney General has stubbornly refused for nearly two years to appoint an independent counsel. It is clear from our hearing on Tuesday that all three of our witnesses believe that the Attorney General is not following the law. Now, if this is the case, the American people have a right to know what's happening. We are the elected representatives of the American people. If we believe that the Attorney General is not following the law, then we have a responsibility to find out why. In our hearing, both Mr. LaBella and Mr. Free asked us not to insist on getting these memos. They made their case very well. I understand their concerns. I know why they feel that way. Under normal circumstances, we would not have subpoenaed them. But these are not normal circumstances. We have a reasonable basis for believing that the Attorney General is not upholding the law, and we have an obligation under the Constitution to find out if that's the case. The Attorney General said in her press conference on Tuesday that by demanding these memos, we are injecting politics into this investigation. But she's missing the point. 
we're trying to make sure that politics are not injected into the investigation. The Attorney General is a political appointee of the President. He is her boss. Before she came to Washington, she was an elected Democratic official. How can she credibly con conduct an investigation of the President of her own party? That's why we created the Independent Counsel Law in the first place. The Attorney General has accused me of trying to pressure her into appointing an independent counsel. And Mr. Waxman has said the same thing. I have to tell you, it's kind of kind of sad that every time things get a little heated around here, the other side feels like they have to throw out these wild accusations. But since they have been made, I will set the record straight. We issued the subpoena for two memos, nothing else. The Attorney General has refused to pr produce them. She has not claimed any valid privilege. The only privilege she could claim would be executive privilege by the President. She has not moved an inch to try to reach an accommodation with us. The committee has a need to see these documents. The Attorney General has refused to make them available. That's why we're here today, period, end of sentence. I had hoped that the Attorney General would work with us in good faith to try to resolve this impasse. She hasn't, and I'm very sorry that she hasn't. On Tuesday, she called me 15 minutes before the hearing started, and she asked to testify, 15 minutes. She called Mr. Waxman before she even called me. She knew full well, as a simple courtesy to the members of the committee, you do not call 15 minutes before a hearing and ask to come and testify. And then she held a press conference and criticized me for not letting her appear. Since I didn't allow her to testify, she sent a four-page letter explaining her views. Unfortunately, I never got it. I had Mr. Lantos read it to me here in the committee room. Why did Mr. Lantos get a letter addressed to me before I saw it? This was a long, detailed, legalistic letter. It looked like it was drafted long before the Attorney General ever called me 15 minutes before the hearing. It all looked heavily orchestrated. The letter was addressed to me, but it wasn't sent to me. It was sent to Mr. Lantos. He read it to me here in the hearing room. She wrote a four-page letter and didn't even have the courtesy to give it to me before she gave it to the minority. Are these the actions of someone who wants to find a mutually satisfactory agreement? Mr. Holder and other Justice Department employees were calling members of the committee trying to peel off votes. That's inappropriate. If they had worked as hard trying to find some middle ground, we wouldn't be here today. The Attorney General has said that the subpoena is unprecedented. She said that the Justice Department has never given this type of information to Congress. Well, that just isn't true. On Tuesday, Director Free admitted as much. There have been numerous cases where just this kind of information was provided to congressional committees. These examples go all the way back to the Teapot Dome scandal. I'm not saying that this kind of information should be provided to Congress on a routine basis. I don't think it should. But this is a highly unusual situation. The head of the Campaign Finance Task Force and the director of the FBI have said the Attorney General is not following the law. We have an obligation to find out why this is happening, and we cannot do that if we can't see those memos. The Attorney General wants us to wait for three weeks, which puts us right in the middle of the August recess, when there will be no members here. We faced a lot of stalling tactics over the last year and a half. We've had delay after delay, and it's a disservice to the Congress and the American people. The August recess is coming up, and we'll be rushing to finish up in September. I'm not inclined to leave this matter unresolved. At any rate, the Attorney General has given no indication that she's willing to be more forthcoming in September than she is today. Let me restate what I said at the beginning of this statement. I regret deeply that we have to meet today under these circumstances. I had really hoped that we could work out an agreement so this would not be necessary. Last year, when things came to a head with the White House, we were able to reach an accommodation with Mr. Ruff. It wasn't easy. It took a lot of negotiation, but we did it. I just don't understand why it hasn't been possible this time. I've been willing to reach a middle ground. Our committee has been willing to reach a middle ground. However, in conversations between my staff and the Attorney Generals, there hasn't been any sign of movement whatsoever on their part. This committee has received a lot of classified documents. We've received numerous classified briefings. This information has never seen the light of day. And you might recall that FBI Director Louis Free said as much before this committee that we kept the confidence of those who briefed us. This committee has received confidential briefings from Justice Department. We have never divulged any of that information. On Tuesday, Director Free complimented the entire committee, as I said, for that. For the Attorney General or anyone else to suggest that we would cavalierly publicize information that would jeopardize criminal prosecutions 
is irresponsible. We are the Congress of the United States. We have a duty to make sure that the laws are faithfully executed. That's what the Constitution says. If it appears that the Attorney General is not upholding the law, then the people have a right to know why. And that's why we're here today. And with that, I yield to Mr. Waxman. Mr. Uh, Chairman, before I respond to your comments on contempt, I want to bring to your attention an article in a newspaper called The Hill, Texas donor GOP evaded uh, the law. This story uh, details a troubling report of conduit payments to a Republican campaign and suggests a possible scheme by Republicans, including leaders of the Republicans in the House, to evade our campaign finance laws. I want to give you a letter. It's signed by all the Democrats on this committee with one exception. And that, is exception uh, is, that exception is Congressman Jim Turner, who has recused himself. I want to commend Representative Turner for taking that step. He's doing so, as he explains in a letter to me, which I would ask unanimous, unanimous consent to be included in the record, because the illegal contribution was given to his Republican opponent. And Jim doesn't want even the appearance of a conflict, so he's recusing himself. In the 20 months of uh, your investigation, Mr. Chairman, you have not held any hearings on Republican campaign abuses. Indeed, as our letter to you points out, you have previously promised specific subpoenas to groups like Triad. You did that in two occasions, in two public meetings, and then you didn't issue those subpoenas. We think the illegal contributions detailed in that newspaper story, in this Hill newspaper, it's a serious matter. And we ask that you schedule a hearing on these conduit contributions as our next order of business. As to your demand that the committee hold the Attorney General in contempt, I would observe this is another sad day for this committee. During the past two years, we have seen this committee systematically demean and abuse almost every tool of congressional investigations. The subpoena process has been abused by issuing over 600 unilateral subpoenas, some of which were astoundingly broad and issued without any legitimate basis. The immunity process has been abused by granting immunity to at least one witness who provided inaccurate testimony to our committee, and in the process, receive protection from other potentially serious wrongdoing. The deposition process has been abused by harassing witnesses without cause and demanding that they return to the committee, in one case, for as many as five separate days of deposition. Can you imagine what that means when someone has to come for five days with a lawyer for a deposition to answer the same questions over and over again. Can any American citizen understand what it means when the intrusive power of government can force you to come to a closed door meeting of lawyers who can ask you questions about anything in your private life and you have to answer or you could be held in contempt of Congress? Is anything more intrusive? Is government, big government, any more objectionable except in those kinds of cases where individual liberties are infringed upon. Today, Mr. Chairman, you're demeaning perhaps the most serious power we have, the power of contempt. We aren't faced with an attorney general refusing to cooperate with us. She's willing to work with the committee, and she's made what FBI Director Free called an extraordinary offer. She has agreed to brief the chairman on the contents of Mr. Labella's memo in two weeks. And in two weeks, she has said she will complete a review of the memo and decide whether to seek an independent counsel. She'd made this offer to Chairman Burton, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Henry Hyde, and Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Orrin Hatch. And I'd like to have a video 
of what Senator Hatch said and how he reacted to this very same proposal by the Attorney General. Well, as soon as we get to the right portion in the uh, tape, I think it's, uh, it's worth noting how other chairmen, Republican chairmen, in positions of responsibility, even more than this committee, because they have the legislative jurisdiction over the independent counsel statute, uh, reacted uh, to the issue of, um, of uh, how, uh, whether to uh, bring uh, Janet Reno in and force her uh, to um, will the spawn <coughs> will the without giving her sufficient time. Will the gentleman I, yield? No, I won't yield. You'll have your chance, and I, I want to have mine. Now, the chairman said she hasn't even tried to act in good faith. She didn't try to find a middle ground. Uh, I, I think that what he says is transparently false. She met with the chairman and with director of the FBI, Louis Free, and myself on Friday. She asked that she be given the courtesy of three weeks in which to make her decision, and then she would come up and brief the chairman and the ranking Democrat on her decision and her legal reasoning and go into the memo so that we could understand whether she agreed or disagreed with the legal reasoning of Mr. Labella and Mr. Free. Chairman refused to accept that. He called a hearing the day before yesterday. She called the chairman before that hearing. She called me first and said, I'm going to call the chairman. I want to come in. I feel strongly about it. Uh, how should I handle it? And I said, well, you ought to call the chairman first. She, she was even thinking of showing up so that she could make the argument to the Republican members and let them understand that she is acting in good faith. She called the chairman, and he refused to let her testify. So she sent a letter instead. She asked that she have a conference call with Chairman Burton and myself last night. After the conference call was set up, we were told Mr. Burton wasn't available. So we set up another conference call for this morning at 8.30. Uh, I got the call, but I was told that Mr. Burton, again, was not available. I talked to the Attorney General, and I understand she talked to uh, the Chairman. And she offered a new offer. And she said, look, I'm going to make my decision. I'll come up and brief not just the Chairman and the ranking Democrat, but all the members of the committee as to my reasoning. I'll even go into the, uh, the memo, uh, memos as it relates to the legal arguments. I suggested to her that in light of what Director Free and Mr. Labella had to say, that was uh, something they felt uncomfortable about because they thought their legally, legal reasoning was so closely tied to some of the facts, and they didn't want those facts uh, out because it might jeopardize their criminal prosecution. She said she understood, but she was willing to uh, make this offer, and she th said it would be a very delicate matter, but she, she would do her best to handle it. The chairman rejected that offer, and it's today said that she has not even tried to find a middle ground. Well, what offers have been made by the chairman to the attorney general? Give us that memo, or you'll be held in contempt. Now, I'd like to have the members see what Senator Hatch had to say when he was offered the same proposal by the attorney general. Before you go. Charles LaBella, who heads up the Justice Department's investigation into campaign fundraising allegations of abuse. Louis Free, the director of the FBI, nonpartisan. And Mr. DeSarno, who's the other investigator. Are all recommending to the Attorney General the appointment of independent counsel to look at fundraising abuses. And Janet Reno, as we speak this morning, says no. Well, she doesn't say no. I just chatted with her uh, uh, two nights ago. And she wants about three weeks to really review the 100-page or so, well, I think 100-page document from Mr. DeBella. She's certainly going to re-review the, uh, the FBI director's uh, memorandum where he said that it's hard to think of a case 
where you need an independent counsel more than this one. Dabella seemed to say that she has misinterpreted the statute. And then DeSano is the other investigator who, uh, is, who's a phrase top investigator who agrees to DeSano, that, that the uh, Labella memorandum is right. So here you have the top two investigators, the top prosecutor, recommending that she, that she has to request the appointment of an independent counsel. I believe she'll do the right thing in the end, but I told her that I'd be happy to give her that time. She's agreed to sit down with Chairman Hyde and me uh, sometime near the end of this month and, uh, and discuss where, what her position will be and discuss those memoranda with us. She so doesn't, you, you she doesn't you... want to give up the memoranda because she claims that it's a blueprint of their uh, prosecutorial investigation. investigation. That isn't necessarily a good answer, but the fact is, is that uh, we're not going to subpoena those until uh, we sit down with her probably towards the end of this month, and I hope she'll live up to the statute and do the right thing. So within three weeks, we'll have a decision from Janarina. If she doesn't do the right thing here, she'll lose credibility, because I believe... That was what Senator Hatch, a, clearly a Republican leader of this Congress, had to say when he was offered by the Attorney General the opportunity to give her sufficient time to review the memo, to meet with her advisors, all of her advisors, to make her decision, and then to come forward and explain her decision. It's a reasonable proposal, and reasonable people acting in good faith can find common ground in that uh, proposal. Reasonable people can avoid unnecessary confrontations. They can work constructively toward comedy and bipartisanship. And there is, unfortunately, another way, the way of this committee. Here we seem to avoid conciliation and bipartisanship at any cost. Here the chairman seems to relish every fight and goes out of his way to provoke every imaginable showdown. What does it accomplish? Nothing. Any fight, of course, attracts some media attention. But are we doing anything of consequence today? No. Our investigation has been so discredited by the chairman's mistakes and partisanship <coughs> that no one pays any attention to us anymore. One Republican chief counsel of this committee quit because he wasn't allowed, in his words, to conduct a professional investigation. The committee's chief investigator was fired at the ins instance, insistence of the speaker, Newt Gingrich, because he doctored the Webb-Hubble transcripts. One former senior Republican staff member was even quoted by name a few months ago saying that 90% of the staff doesn't have a clue as to how to conduct an investigation. These are the words of a Republican staff person. We subpoenaed innocent people by mistake, harassed witnesses in depositions, and caused international incidents when investigators traveled overseas. It's a record that has reduced us to irrelevancy. Now, a good part of today is political theater. This meeting of the committee is being staged in the hope of doing something drastic. We will appear relevant once again. The guiding principle seems to be that it's better to be reckless and extreme than to be ignored. And part of today is just raw intimidation. Chairman Burton explicitly told the Attorney General that although he seeks to hold her in contempt, he will drop his efforts at a contempt citation if she agrees to appoint an independent counsel. But if she doesn't appoint an independent counsel, she risks contempt. I want to remind my colleagues that the penalty for contempt can be a year in jail and a $10,000 fine. Is that what we've come to? We threaten the Attorney General with jail time if she doesn't make the decision that the Chairman wants? Now, there are some countries that do throw people in jail for exercising their independence. Powerful dictators punish disobedience with jail. But America has never been that way. Americans have never tolerated raw abuses of power, and I know that they won't tolerate this committee's attempt to intimidate Attorney General Reno. Every member of this committee 
Republican and Democrat should be offended and embarrassed by this blatant strong-arm tactic. Nobody in the country, least of all a member of Congress, should try to extort a decision from the Attorney General. It doesn't matter whether one supports or opposes the appointing of an independent counsel in this particular case. This odious threat of contempt is beneath contempt. The contempt citation may pass our committee, and I expect it will. The Republicans have caucused. They're all here. The record every time has been they've marched in lockstep and voted on a partisan basis. We have probably the most partisan committee in the Congress of the United States. But it's not going to go anywhere after that. The House is unlikely to take up the matter when we return in September, and no U.S. attorney is likely to prosecute the Attorney General, even if the House votes on contempt. And on top of that, no court would ever enforce the contempt citation because the subpoena to the Attorney General was not validly issued. The chairman violated the rules of the committee in issuing the subpoena because the working group did not meet in good faith. I've written the chairman a letter explaining this, which I asked to be inserted in the record. And I seriously doubt that a court would uphold this defective subpoena. Aside from these procedural defects, Mr. Burton's demand for Mr. Labella's memo is ludicrous on the merits. On Tuesday, the chairman recounted the qualifications of Director Free, Mr. Labella, and D Mr. DeSarno. And this is what he said, and I want to show another video for those members and the public who didn't watch the hearing the other day. He is a former FBI agent. He's a formal federal prosecutor. He's a formal, former federal judge. And attorney Janet Reno dismissed his advice. Two weeks ago, assistant U.S. attorney Charles LaBella again urged Janet Reno to appoint an independent counsel. He has run the task force investigation of foreign money in our elections for the last 10 months. Janet Reno handpicked Mr. LaBella for this job because of his sparkling credentials and his reputation as an outstanding prosecutor. I can't think of anyone in America who is in a better position to know the facts. Well, Chairman said there's no one better in America to know the facts than Mr. LaBella. He told us to listen carefully to what Mr. Free had to say. He extolled their credentials because he believed it would enhance the credibility of his call for an independent counsel. But Mr. Burton ignores their very strong views on why it's wrong for the Attorney General to give the, La the LaBella memo to Congress. For my colleagues who, again, perhaps missed the testimony, I want to share some of, Doc of Director Free's, Mr. LaBella's, and Mr. DeSarno's comments with you. What we see here is deference being paid to your recommendations when the chairman approves of them, but no deference to your recommendations when he disapproves. And if we go to a contempt citation this Thursday against the Attorney General of the United States, it will be because she refused to turn over the memo uh, written by you, Director Free, and the memo written by Mr. Labello, which both of you, I assume, think this committee should not receive at this point. I certainly believe that it's not prudent to receive it at this point, and I think, uh, again, respectfully, the contempt citation, well beyond the Attorney General, will send a, a very uh, chilling message to prosecutors and uh, special agents around the country. So I urge you to just, as I know you will, deliberate very carefully about that, because the implications go well beyond this issue and this Attorney General. Sound down there. Very much. Uh, Mr. LaBella, did you... You concur in that the last thing in the world that I want to see as, as the, the um, prosecutor heading this task force is that this memo ever get disclosed. I'll go beyond three weeks. I don't think that it should ever see the light of day uh, because this, in my judgment, would be devastating to the, to the investigations that the men and women of the task force are, are working on right now and that I put my blood, sweat, and tears into, and I don't want to see that jeopardized. And I, I would even be stronger than the director. 
I, I can't see a, a set of circumstances under which this report should see the light of day. I understand that perhaps at some time there could be a confidential briefing of some of the aspects in this report, but if I were an independent counsel going to get this case, or if I'm a, a prosecutor who's going to prosecute these cases later on, the first thing that I want to do is talk to me. The second thing I want to do is to read this report. And the third thing I want not to happen is that this report see the light of day, because that would just undercut what any prosecutor would do with these investigations, whether they're an independent counsel or a Department of Justice prosecutor. That's my belief as a career prosecutor. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Sonner, do you agree? Yes, I think it would be devastating if that, uh, if that report were to ma be made public. This isn't, these aren't my words. These are the words of the three officials who are most responsible for the conduct of the campaign finance prosecution. They're telling us that releasing the Labella memo would provide a roadmap to their case and devastate their prosecution. And the chairman pays no attention to them. Let me remind my colleagues again of who is warning us against demanding the memo. The lead FBI agent on the case, the lead prosecutor, and the director of the FBI. I'm not aware that the chairman ever worked at the FBI or that he ever prosecuted a criminal case or had any experience with law enforcement. And yet today, he has no reservations about substituting his judgment for our top law enforcement personnel. The chairman made another statement I want to correct for the record. He quoted uh, Mr. Free as saying that uh, among the covered individuals under the independent counsel was the president and the vice president of the United States. You would think by his statement, the innuendo was that the president and the vice president are under uh, intense scrutiny, and in fact, Director Free believes that uh, they ought to have an independent counsel to look at them. Well, what he didn't tell us, it's sort of reminiscent of the Hubble tapes, isn't it? What Mr. Free said later, and I want to read the transcript. We don't have the video, so if you'll forgive me, I'll read the transcript. Mr. Free, going back to the answer he gave, my answer was in the context of a response to the conflict provision and whether or not I believed there was sufficient conflict to trigger the statute. And my view is that this is the case. The subject matter of our, of our investigation involves covered persons, including, as I mentioned, the president and vice president. I don't think there's anything astounding about that. That's the subject matter of the inquiry. But going back to what I said in my opening statement, it's often misunderstood, which is why I was reluctant in December to even tell you my recommendation that a recommendation to trigger the statute under either the substantive provision but equally under the discretionary provision does not mean that I have reached the, any conclusions about guilt or innocence or even a probable cause finding. What the statute says is that only further investigation is warranted and that there's a predicate which constitute a sufficient basis to inquire. So please don't take from my remarks, as I know you won't, any indication that I've come to any conclusion or findings about wrongdoing or criminal activity by the president, the vice president, or anyone else. <coughs> Today, if the Republican majority wants to support the chairman, our actions will be added to the growing list of travesties that this committee has inflicted on the oversight and congressional process. We've made a shambles of any pretense of seriousness <coughs> or dignity. I urge my colleagues to listen to the Attorney General, listen to Senator Hatch, listen to FBI Agent DeSarno, listen to the prosecutor, Mr. LaBella, listen to Director Free. They are all on one side. Chairman Burton is on the other. I urge you to oppose this resolution. We Chairman. will. Uh, we will go to the five-minute rule. Before we do that, I wanted to uh, uh, make uh, one uh, correction, and that is, or illuminate one issue. Our subpoena to the Attorney General specifically said that we did not want any 6 C or grand jury material. We don't want anything that would jeopardize the investigation, and whatever is transmitted to this. 
committee in confidence will be kept in confidence. It's not going to be for public consumption. But the representatives of the people of the United States have the right and the obligation to know why she's declining to follow the chief investigator's recommendations that by law mandate that she appoint an independent counsel. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Director Free said it's impossible Mr. to uh, separate Mr. the Scarborough. conclusions on the law and the Thank facts you, under which he's prosecuted. I, I, now call, I now call up the committee report entitled Refusal of Attorney General Janet Reno to Produce Documents Subpoenaed by the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, and I ask unanimous consent that the re report be considered as, as read without objection to order. I now will recognize uh, uh, out of order because I think he has some relevant things Mr. to Chairman. talk about. I will recognize Reserving Mr. the right to object. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, I hear these complaints, and I, you know, I went back and did a little bit of research with the help of the committee because I've, I've heard the broken record before about the partisan witch hunts and how everything we do is just so awful and how the future of Western civilization is in jeopardy because of what we do. And I went back to a June 1996 hearing last time that we had to get this White House to actually stop stalling um, and try to get some information on the Travelgate affair. We heard the same charges, the same witch hunt charges. And of course, after we went ahead and, and had to find the White House in contempt, uh, we of course found out that they illegally seized 900 FBI files about as serious and an abuse of power as I think any of us have ever seen. I remember Chuck Colson being sent to jail for misusing one FBI file. But I went to Mr. Waxman's comments, and I have respect for Mr. Waxman, and it, I'm, I only point him out because he's the ranking member, but all the Democrats... This is what he said in June of 1996. It's identical to what he's saying this morning. Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, this is not an issue of the con Constitution and all of the gravity that has been described. This is just a political witch hunt. This is a committee that has been spending over hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to beat up on this administration. They have not found one shred of evidence that there was any wrongdoing. So we found out after the contempt order that uh, 900 FBI files had been illegally seized. He went on to say, it just seems to me that what we have here is a political attempt to embarrass this administration, a clumsy one to hold responsible people at the White House public service uh, servants criminally liable. I think this committee has everything that it needs to know about in the Travelgate matter. And now what we're trying to do is keep this issue alive until after the election to try to embarrass President Clinton. I think it's unfair, I think it's unworthy of the Congress, and I think it's unworthy of this committee to abuse our powers in this way. Talk about an abuse of powers. What we find out after we subpoena the White House with every single Democrat voting against getting the information we needed to know to find out they illegally seized 900 FBI files, we find out the true abuse of power. And, this, and, and they weren't talking about Chairman Burton. They were talking at that time about Chairman Bill Klinger. This is what they went on to say, and it's the same playbook. We, we heard that the Republicans were going to be voting in lockstep. Well, this is what was said in June of 96. This is going to be a partisan vote. The Republicans will have a majority, and they are going to win. But let me tell you that whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, the majority or the minority, you should have some restraints on you. And one restraint should be the fact that we should not accuse people of crimes without at least hearing what they have to say. His prediction was borne out. Not a single Democrat voted to get the information that we needed to find out that 900 FBI files had been illegally seized. Not a single Democrat did it then, and I suspect they will not do it again. And finally, this plea to just wait. Let's just wait a little bit longer. Let's just let the White House drag it out a little bit more. And talking about the Hill, I look at the front page of the Washington Post and find yet another tactic that the White House is using to stall. That's all they know about doing, stalling till after the election. This is what the ranking member said in 96. I say this to my Republican friends. You are going to regret this because I think what you are doing is the wrong thing. Another week or two would allow us to hear the other side of the case. Another week or two, let's just wait a little bit longer. Let's just let the White House stall a little bit longer. Now, I'm not speaking uh, Mr. Waxman, to the actual uh, facts of this matter about the subpoena issue without even going into uh, 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 the, the statements. I'm just talking about a constant 
a constant delaying tactic, a constant obstruction, it seemed to me, to everything that either this committee or the committee in the 104th Congress tried to do. I mean, we had legitimate, legitimate arguments. We went after uh, uh, in investigations. We, we went after subpoenas that were ignored. And only by bringing contempt charges did we find out that this White House illegally seized 900 FBI files. Were it, were it for the Democratic uh, uh, members on this committee, that would have never happened. And I will yield to the gentleman. I just want to say this, though. The Democrats have uncovered no leads. They've uncovered none of the millions in foreign money that went to the DNC, hundreds of thousands, which still hasn't been returned. And really, I don't believe they've asked any probing questions of the witnesses. I agree. I agree that Republicans, as well as Democrats, in every election year, uh, uh, make mistakes. But I've got to tell you, any argument that there's a moral equivalency between re what Republicans did in 1996 and what Democrats did in 1996 is not borne out by the facts, nor is it borne out by any major media uh, uh, outlet. And uh, I, at this time, I, I'd be glad to yield to Mr. Waxman. I thank you for yielding. Let me point out that we objected to the subpoenas on the FBI files, but we lost. The committee got the information. There was no evidence of uh, seizing FBI files illegal, illegally. There was evidence of incompetence in getting those FBI files. Well, I, uh, I, I, I yield back uh, uh, the balance of my time. But that was that. Well, that was. If I can just say this, I, well, I and, and after we, I no, regular, regular order. order. I'm reclaiming my time. Regular order. Uh, I'm reclaiming my regular time. You know, order. actually, all we heard from the Democrats after we found out that the 900 FBI files Gentlemen. had been seized was that Mr. Livingstone Point should kill Mr. himself. And I yield back the balance of my time. The what gentleman's time? time has expired. We are going to try on both Point sides. Point of information, Mr. Chairman. Did, well, before we get to your point of information, just uh, let me make a statement. Because uh, there's strong feelings on this issue on both <laughs> sides, and because this is a historic moment, l let me just <laughs> let me just say, well, I, I, I don't know what's so funny about that. Would you like to explain to me why you think it's funny? Hey, Ron, we were ne sure ne never mind. We, that was a rhetorical question. Let me just say, we're going to try to stick to the five-minute rule <laughs> as much as possible. And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be very uh, uh, close with the gavel today. The Democrats now have a... What's the you have a point, point of information. information. Was the gentleman. gentleman from Florida, my good friend, suggesting that it was illegal to be a Democrat or a Democratic Party sympathizer? Or what, what well, is the essential was it, was, it, was it illegal? What do you mean? Well, you... Regular order. That just being a Democrat is illegal. Mr. Regular. No, I was just questioning whether you should really obstruct us getting 900 All FBI right. files. Let's, let's keep some order around here. Mr. Fattah, do you want to be recognized for five minutes? Well, I think we okay. go in order soon. All right. right. Who wants to be recognized on your side? Mr. Lantos, you're recognized for five minutes. I would like to yield first to my colleague from California. Thank you for yielding. Uh, Mr. Scarborough was not a member of this Congress or this committee when we did that investigation. Uh, we found incompetence in the FBI files. We found... I, yes, sir, I was. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess I... I, I was. I corrected. We found incompetence... I was just... I'm soft Excuse spoken. me. I have, my, I have the time that is yielded to me. We found incompetence, but no illegality. And the gentleman, I want to point out to him, may not know this, but I called for an independent counsel over a year and a half ago to do a competent professional investigation, which this committee has not done. Thank you. Well, let me first... Uh, comment on Ms. Scarborough's observation that there is no moral equivalence between the two sides. This, I take it, means that there is a moral superiority on your side, which is nothing short of laughable. I want to first uh, identify myself with the statement of my colleague. I want to commend him for a singularly effective laying out of the facts. Uh, this attempt to hold our distinguished Attorney General in contempt of Congress is, in fact, beneath contempt. It is an attempt on the part of Mr. Burton to criminalize the holding of divergent views. And since we have now heard from the FBI director and the top investigators, who of course agree with us that these memos should not be made public, I would like to share with uh, my colleagues some of the editorial views of the most respected newspapers in the country. Let me begin with the New York Times. A confrontation over the reports would be unsound on legal grounds 
and counterproductive. The Los Angeles Times. Congress has no business threatening Reno with contempt charges. This is a fishing expedition by Dan Burton. The precedent Burton seeks could make the executive branch a ground for all sorts of witch hunts by those who second guess motives and judgments of decision makers. The Chicago Tribune, foolish threat against Reno. Given their professed desire to see that the law is enforced, you would think that Burton and his GOP colleagues <coughs> would be leery of any step that might hinder prosecutors. The threat of contempt citation makes sense only if their real purpose is to embarrass the administration. Newsday in saying, hold on to the memos. This is sheer pig-headedness on Burton's part. St. Petersburg Times, give Reno some room. The integrity of the investigations is more important than a few congressional Republicans grabbing some headlines. Burton should stop this showboating and follow the lead of his more temperate colleagues. What is clear is that Burton should wipe away the froth around his mouth and stop demanding information that he has no right to. This attempt to bully this most distinguished attorney general is sickening to me and it is sickening to the American people. Is anybody seriously thinking that the Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno, will go to prison because he has the audacity to hold a view contrary to the view of uh, Mr. Burton? The top law enforcement officials in this country, beginning with the director of the FBI, consider the release of these memos devastating, devastating to the prosecution of criminals. We have heard these statements time and time again, and it appears they have made no impact on some of my colleagues on the other side. I hope, I hope that everybody in this country is watching this debate, because we can see a committee which is exercising its power with an ultimate degree of arrogance, running amok. The Attorney General has the privilege of making a decision to withhold these memos. The Director of the FBI agrees with her. The top investigator agrees with her. The top FBI agent working on this project agrees with her, the media agree with her, and I'm sure that the American people agree with her. She has the courage to stand up to political bullying, and she has our support. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, Mr. Hastert. <clears throat> I thank the uh, chairman. You know, I'm not a lawyer, and I seem to be a non-lawyer in a sea of lawyers here, but one of the things I try to do is to represent my district in Illinois and try to represent the people of the United States. And part of that just comes to common sense. So as a layman or a non-lawyer's view of what goes on, I've sat in this committee uh, for a long time. And uh, over the 12 years in my tenure in the Congress, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, we have retorts going back and forth. And I guess to my good friend, the gentleman from California, I, I guess arrogance is in the eyes of the beholder. But to see what has happened over a period of years, focusing on this investigation, uh, is astounding to me. And again, I'm saying I'm a non-lawyer in a sea of lawyers. I remember going to a top secret, high level briefing held by the FBI and the Department of Justice about a year and a half ago, up in the top secret uh, rooms that we have on the fourth floor of the, co of the, of the Capitol. And we're going to be, because this, co this committee has this jurisdiction, we're going to be told what, what's happening. Well, again, I was astounded because we went up, and, you know, went to the, through the doors with the dials on them and the tones to, so it's soundproof and sat in there and the FBI was there and the <coughs> 
Justice Department was there and said, well, you know, we really can't tell you anything because we're going to internalize this investigation. We're going to take it over. We're going to do this investigation. We can't release to this committee that has jurisdiction over campaign uh, finance and, and uh, the political problems that erupted. Uh, you can't know this because we can't let this information out. And so I don't think that, I hope I'm not revealing top secret information, but that's what they basically told us. And so we came back and uh, we let the process happen. We had let the process roll on. And now at a time then, certainly timely, that both the uh, attorney that's in charge of that and the FBI, chief head of the FBI, said there ought to be an independent consul. You know, that's, to my friends across the aisle, what this is really about. It's the recalcitrance of this administration and Department of Justice not to name an independent consul, to let the fox in the chicken coop <laughs> make the decision on who's guilty, who's not guilty, what's going to, <laughs> information is going to flow out, what information is not going to flow out. And I'll tell you, representing the American people, most people are just a little bit sick of this. So we can, you know, frame this. We can take accusations, and I've seen uh, Chairman Burton beat up day in and day out by my friends on the other side of the aisle when they want to change the spotlight from the issue that they're afraid to talk about, and let's put it on something that's non-relevant at the time. So we can beat up the chairman. We can talk about other things that prop up in the Hill, quote, unquote, newspaper. But when we really want to look at the issues, this committee has been shut out day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. And it's time to change the pattern. And let's talk about pattern. Let's talk about another situation that's happened. I'm from Illinois. The IRS had come to the Department uh, to, of Justice <laughs> twice and said, you know, we need to have an investigation on the current senator in Illinois because we think there's $280,000 of campaign funds that have been turned into personal use. And the Department just says, well, we don't think so. Twice, unprecedented, unprecedented, they've refused to name a grand jury to investigate. And just the other day, they said, well, you know, we're going to take this and we're going to do an internal investigation. If we think somebody's done wrong in our committee, we'll internalize this. You know, we won't hear about this for another two or three or four years. And that's the pattern. And that's the problem. You can't do this, folks, day in and day out. You know, the chairman said this is not <coughs> political. He said it's an issue of law, and I agree. Uh, it's about other things. There's two ways that we can avoid this. And it's certainly not intimidation. It's common sense. It's the law. We could have had an independent consul. We wouldn't be talking here today if we had that. We also, uh, you know, the White House can claim executive privilege. But we haven't even seen the first step to do this. And she gonna, the, the Attorney General could avoid all this. But, you know, that's their, certainly their privilege. But they haven't done this. You know, and... and Legally, we have a right to information. That's another issue. This committee has the right to information. And that goes to directly campaign funding, raising uh, illegal, uh, illegalities in the White House. And contrary to what somebody on the other aisle said, that Mr. Free said, this issue goes to the very deepest crevices of the White House. That's what we need to talk about, and I yield back to the uh, Gentleman's time mind. has expired. Uh, who, who seeks time? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wise, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, the previous speaker just complained about the committee being shut out. The reason that the committee, or some members of the committee may feel shut out, because the committee keeps slamming the door on itself. I've worked on this committee now, and had the privilege of working on this committee since 1983. <laughs> in a host of administrations and different combinations of one party in control of the Congress and another in control of the, of the White House. I also had the privilege of serving as a 
chairman, a subcommittee chairman for four years, overseeing the Department of Justice. And the ranking member, the lead Republican then and I, never made any move on the Department of Justice, never held any investigation, never asked for any materials that we did not consult each other and agree. And in a matter like this, where we had to go and look at matters under investigation, we always worked together because we knew that the credibility of anything we did uh, could only come about through a unified approach. But we don't have that anymore. On the record, I wanted also noted that I called for an independent counsel many, many months ago, about the same time that the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, did. Not because I had any great inside knowledge, but just because it seemed to me that an independent counsel was necessary that could do two things, to follow up all the allegations made about the White House, yes, but also all the allegations made about campaign irregularities in both parties. Because the soft money explosion has caused, uh, I think, problems and a nuclear meltdown in the election system for both parties. But, that but the Attorney General chose not to go that way for reasons that she's publicly stated. The, the allegation or the statement is made that it's all right to release these or to bring these memos to this committee because they'll be kept in confidence. Regrettably, the history of this committee is that it leaks like a sieve that anything you bring to this committee will shortly be in the front pages of the newspapers, um, uh, and actually sometimes before you even knew that it was within the committee uh, bailiwick, uh, whether it's the Webster-Hubble tapes, whether it's memos, depositions, whatever it is. I guess I want to turn to the point that I, I'm not, I won't get caught up in arguments about uh, uh, whether or not, uh, what, what the motivations of somebody may be or may not be. I'd like to talk directly about what the people in charge of doing any kind of prosecution. This committee, incidentally, does not prosecute. This committee cannot indict anybody. The Justice Department indicts. Incidentally, they have indicted at this point 11 people so far in this campaign investigation. But so what is it, who is it that is in, what is it that the people in charge of the investigation themselves are saying about the, bringing these memos to this committee? They're saying, don't do it because it compromises, indeed threatens, their very prosecutions. Who are these people? The FBI director, the head of the task force, the Justice Department task force, the chief FBI agent doing the investigations, all agree they don't want these memos out of the Department of Justice. They don't want the memos. Whether or not they think that there should be an independent counsel, they don't want these memos coming to this committee because of the chance that it can compromise the prosecutions that they're working on. I would just urge my Republican colleagues and my Democratic colleagues too, but to please be very, very careful when, if you vote for this subpoena and, or vote to hold the Attorney General in contempt, because regrettably it can be on your hands if indeed prosecutions are not able to come. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Scarborough, read to us quotes from 1996 how much they're in context or not, each can judge for themselves. I would caution against somebody reading back a year from now statements from the Department of Justice prosecutors or others saying we weren't able to move this prosecution forward because of the material that went to this committee and, and made our prosecutions impossible. If you don't think that's possible, talk to Oliver North. He benefited from a committee that was not able to handle itself uh, in, in, uh, in not able to handle certain materials. So I would be very, very concerned about demanding or holding the Attorney General in contempt, particularly when those directly in charge of the investigation and who are, do not appear to be any friends of hers in the sense that uh, they, they have recommended at least public, or have recommended to her that there be an independent counsel, but when they at the same time please don't release these memos. There's a final irony though here, and that is that many here who profess to want prosecution the most may end up making any prosecution impossible. Because if you hold the Attorney General in contempt, if you force this through so that those memos have to come to this committee and ultimately it's concluded by those that have to handle the prosecutions that they're not able to because the prosecutions were compromised, you have made impossible that which you say you want the most. I would like to see someday a true bipartisan investigation and one that looks at all parties and all irregularities. We won't get it with this action today and I would urge members to think carefully and reject this motion to hold the Attorney General in contempt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time.
I'd like to make one real brief uh, comment, and that is Director Free noted on Tuesday that the committee <laughs> has kept sensitive information confidential, and he appreciated that. Mr. Cox. Mr. Cox. I thank the chairman, and uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for the <laughs> seriousness that uh, they attach this matter. The conduct of the debate this morning hasn't been ideal, but I think the seriousness that we all attach to it, which might be reflected in some of the emotion in people's comments, is appropriate because uh, what we were talking about is indeed very serious. There are two issues at stake. One is the rule of law, and the other is the relationship between the branches of our government, the legislative and the executive. The independent counsel statute is something with which I disagree. I voted against it at every opportunity in the 10 years that I've been in Congress, and I voted against it because my experience working in the executive branch was that it has a hair trigger, and that it is appropriate in some instances and not in others. Somebody in Congress, a majority in Congress, voted for it. It became the law, uh, and it's uh, today incumbent upon all of us to uphold it. The reason that it is important that the head of the FBI, a former federal judge, uh, has uh, opined as he has done is that he has said that the Attorney General is misreading the law, that the law requires her to appoint an independent counsel. And in fact, we've all read the law and we know what the law says. It says that there should be a preliminary investigation if there is specific and credible evidence and that uh, during that time, most of the law enforcement powers that the AG has uh, are not at her disposal. Uh, that preliminary investigation uh, cannot plea bargain, for example. There's no grand jury. But if after 90 days, uh, the conclusion is there's reason to investigate further, then there shall be an independent counsel. <coughs> we now know that there's an investigation that's ongoing. It's gone on much more than 90 days. And we learned from uh, the director of the FBI when he testified that uh, included uh, in that investigation the covered persons uh, under the statute uh, are the president and the vice president of the United States. Either this is a runaway government investigating people for whom there is no specific and credible evidence to suspect that a crime has been committed. We do not want our executive branch investigating people in that circumstance or there is reason for this investigation to be going on and under which circumstance the independent counsel law requires that there be application made to the court. And that's what we've been told uh, now, not just by the FBI director, but also by uh, the lead prosecutor on the task force that's looking into this and the lead FBI agent uh, who's in charge of it. Upholding that law requires oversight by the Congress. And it raises issues if you are in the executive branch that are very troublesome because how does the Congress do oversight of the Attorney General in a case like this without inquiring into the advice that she's gotten from these people. If the people say on the front page of the New York Times, as uh, uh, although he didn't like to see it there, the FBI director found himself quoted saying that uh, this is the most uh, compelling case for an independent counsel one can imagine. Um, what, uh, what are we to do but to inquire into this uh, and yet, if we do so, we get into the very matter that's under investigation. That is a legitimate law enforcement interest, and it's one that we have to be very sensitive about. And it's the reason that uh, our witnesses told us that uh, they would not like these memoranda made public. They should not be made public. Our subpoena did not ask for the grand jury information. Our subpoena expressly instructed that that all be redacted, be crossed out, so that information before the grand jury, and by the way, this administration reads Rule 60 very broadly, uh, should be cut out of that memo. Second, uh, under our rules, it's deemed to be taken in executive session, so it may not be made public. And I would, I would vote against making that information public uh, in the future. Uh, so if, if you want to count on a majority of this committee not to vote to release that information, uh, I think you've got it. Uh, it should not be made public. But the administration now is put in the position, as uh, uh, Peter Rodino pointed out in his article, The Case for the Independent Counsel, uh, of uh, policing itself. Chairman Rodino wrote uh, in 1994 in a law review article that based on his experience 
as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee during Watergate and Iran-Contra that there must be a check on the Attorney General because we cannot simply trust the Attorney General uh, will discharge his or her statutory duty to investigate the President. He wrote, quote, while I respect this high-minded view of our government, political pragmatism moves me to wonder who is going to investigate the Attorney General if such a breach of duty occurs. And in pursuit of that oversight responsibility, we subpoenaed this memorandum. Having subpoenaed the memorandum, we found that the Justice Department ignored it. There was no partial compliance, nothing. The return date was July 27th, and that has expired long since. Now Congress is in the position of having to enforce its subpoena. Yet the executive branch, if it were serious, could resist this subpoena by claiming executive privilege, and it has refused to do so. If the executive branch is not following its own law, the one way that it has to legally resist the subpoena, it is our duty to vote contempt, and that's why today I shall do so. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by saying here we go again. <coughs> We're here today to discuss the possibility of holding the United States Attorney General in contempt of Congress. This unfortunate fortunate set of circumstances has come about as a result of the Attorney General's decision to consider all of the evidence before she decides to appoint an independent counsel for the campaign finance investigation. The independent counsel statute was enacted to prevent political pressure from interfering, interfering in the prosecutorial decisions. It is my understanding that the Attorney General has been told by the chairman of this committee that she can only avoid a contempt citation by appointing an independent counsel. Wow. In essence, she can save herself by bowing to political pressure. Such an action would undermine the law that Congress enacted and the eternal ge Attorney General swore to uphold. The Attorney General can also save herself by providing this committee with a document that has been described as a roadmap for the department's ongoing criminal investigation into campaign finance abuse. A letter from the Attorney General and FBI Director Free stated that the investigation could be seriously prejudiced by the revelation of inf information contained within the document. <coughs> this committee has a long, long and unfortunate history of leaks of confidential material, including tapes, a web hubble, personal telephone conversations. From a practical standpoint, I cannot blame the Attorney General for refusing to, to turn anything confidential over to this committee we have a history of leaking. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter this list of leaks of this committee into record. The one on November 96, shortly after Mr. Burton was elected chairman, it was reported that Burton confirmed that one of his top aides leaked the confidential phone logs, former Commerce Committee, and of course I can go on and on, and I'd like to, to for the record, to insert this in the record. Uh, our chairman tells us that we need this document to continue this investigation. This investigation has meandered, sputtered, and ultimately gone absolutely nowhere. Staff has traveled from Florida to California, New York, Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia in search for information. The only thing we can say is that staff has a lot of frequent flyer miles. Therefore, I understand that a roadmap may be necessary, but this is not the way to get it. The Attorney General has offered to brief the Chairman and the ranking member on the relevant issues in the memo. I recommend that you agree to that offer and withdraw this reckless and dangerous actions of holding the Attorney General in contempt. It seems to me that the only thing contemptible here is the willingness to force a constitutional crisis to jumpstart this poorly handled investigation. 
And let me also add that this is a serious witch hunt. The committee has obtained over 1 million and 500,000 thousand pages of information. They have brought in 159 witnesses have been deposed. Only 14 of those witnesses have been called for a hearing. If that is not a witch hunt, I think that uh, 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 then there's never been a witch hunt in this world. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm hoping that you would take a look at what you're doing and recognize that here again, this committee is off in the wrong direction. And I want to let it be known, I oppose this contempt citation and urge the members of this committee to forget about uh, all this bipartisan, the, the not, the, this partisan stuff, and let's look at our government and be bipartisan and saying this is the wrong thing to do and the wrong time to do it and that we should just sit and wait. And that's what we should do, Mr. Chairman. On that note, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, who seeks time? The gentlelady from Florida. She passes. Uh, the gentleman from California. Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Looking at this situation, this is not a case of Reno v. Burden. The purpose of this committee is to seek out truth. And the legislative branch is simply exercising its historic authority to compel the executive branch to produce all the documents which Congress needs to fulfill its responsibilities. As I noted a few days ago, this historic authority goes back to the administration of President Washington, and in 1792, Congress asked for all the papers that led to the St. Clair expedition, which was a failure, and President Washington agreed to turn all the papers over to the Congress. And so this is not some new power. This has been a power exerted by the first and second Congresses <coughs> in this country. Now, as you heard from the hearing the other day, it was made very clear by the authors of those memos, Mr. Labella, Mr. Free, that only 1% of what has appeared in the media is known of what they have in their memos. 99% is not known. And I would say with the 1% we ease out and squeeze out by all the delaying games that some members have already cited, and I've sat through the travel gate hearings, the file gate hearings, I've uh, been in depositions where after we let the person go at 8 o'clock in the evening, they dump a 1,000 pages on it but they've been sitting on them for months. So uh, we know the games that have been played. That's the game. If uh, we're going to reveal something in a hearing, the White House press secretary always leaks it to various reporters, so that will be printed a day or two ahead of time, and it's old news. And uh, we've all seen it, and if you haven't seen it, uh, you better get somebody to help you. Uh, what this boils down to is this whole issue is a conflict of interest issue, as well as the prerogatives of the legislative branch in relation to the executive branch. And it would simply be obstruction of justice if we did not do what we ought to do and will do this morning. It was brought out in the testimony of the last few days from both the FBI director and others that they briefed the White House on what is going on in this particular investigation. Now, that ought to be clear to anyone when it's also clear to them that the direction for the 1996 finance scandals came from the highest levels in the White House, both appointed and elected. And to think that justice goes over and briefs people in the White House is a clear conflict of interest in terms of the criminals versus the non-criminals. And there's very little question that the energy behind that 96 pre-election campaign finance raising and the conspiracies of one sort or another that have popped up with it that eventually we stumble into, sort of the British view of muddling through, has gone to the highest levels of the American presidency. And hopefully, that the Attorney General will recommend what the law is very clear 
to have an independent counsel and go to the three-judge panel of the appellate court and have them make that decision. This morning I heard uh, one of the members on the other side uh, talk about legal reasoning. That isn't the question here. The question is, is there a conflict of interest? Mr. Hastert said, uh, most of us who are not attorneys can understand the common sense that yes, when the President of the United States appoints the Attorney General, no matter how honest, and I have no doubt about the honesty of uh, Janet Reno, I knew her before she became Attorney General. Uh, she has a fine record. That isn't the point. The point is, she is appointed by the President of the United States, as is every Attorney General, and that's why you need an independent counsel. Again, if it's the fox chicken coop analogy that Mr. Hastert used, it's just common sense that when you have to s sort of pursue the boss to see if he's committed a crime, it's the likelihood in the public mind would be, wait a minute, how can you do that? He appointed you to this job. And uh, no U.S. attorney was noted by uh, one of the members on the other side they're unlikely to prosecute the Attorney General. That's absolutely true. When John Marshall ruled in favor of the uh, Cherokee Indians, Andrew Jackson, sort of a dictator as president, <laughs> said, well, John Marshall's made his decision. Let's see if he can enforce it. Well, of course, you can't enforce it unless the executive branch backs up the court. And we have seen at the highest levels of the White House, Mr. Carvel, after Judge Starr, to smear him, to try to deter him, to do everything else. That's obstruction of justice and obstruction of the ju judiciary that is almost unknown in the history of this country. And yet, the press has tolerated it, a lot of people have tolerated it, and that is an absolute shameful performance. So let's deal with the conflicts of interest, let's get the truth, let's not worry about some of the legal reasoning. It isn't relevant. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Kanjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my colleague, Mr. Towns of New York, uh, in opening his remarks said, here we go again. And I'd like to just change that a little bit and quote one of the saints of your party uh, in a famous debate with a presidential nominee of my party when he leaned over and said, there you go again. And Mr. Chairman, to you, I say, there you go again just at the time when after all the immunity conflicts were over and we were hoping we had an understanding to getting objective uh, operations of this committee in place so that we could redeem our reputation to the American people and indeed the press and the editorial boards of this country, we're off in another tangent. And uh, listening to all the learned remarks of my colleagues on the other side, I'm beginning to believe that I'm in Never Never Land and do not understand what the issues are here if I understand their remarks. And I would like to try and just paint a picture of where we are right now, what we are doing. And I'm, I'm talking now to my colleagues on the other side, and I hope you'll take it that I'm talking objectively. The report of Mr. Laboa was submitted on July 16th of 1998 a little more than three weeks ago. It is a 100-page report that is replete with evidence, grand jury material, and conclusions of law. And we are suddenly leaving all of our $6 million heavily staffed investigation of campaign finance re reform and are running and saying, we can't survive as a committee, and we can't attain our objective or our mission as appointed by the Congress unless we get this report. And as I understand it, the makers of the report and the highest levels uh, other than the Attorney General in the Justice Department are responding and say, you will cripple the criminal prosecution. This is an ongoing process for a year uh, we, we have included in this report material that, if exposed, will vitiate a year's work and all the attendant prosecutions that uh, could go along with that work. 
And we're so intent to say, oh, no, we're, we're one day away from going home for a month, and we're 90 days away from an election. And I, I don't think in any way that is the driving force here of my chairman. I don't think he would inject a political timetable into this request. I'm certain of that. But why are we doing this, and why are we rushing a contempt resolution here? Well, I, I suspect that it's August, quiet time in Washington. We don't have something, a potential contempt of Congress going on or some other thing or material pouring in that we can keep uh, the hungry press fed over the month of August. This chairman and this committee won't be headlines in the, morning, in the evening news and in the headlines in the paper. And what really is the issue? The issue is, I think, a question on the majority side whether or not the Attorney General is properly carrying out the law, which she has a disagreement of judgment and opinion on as opposed to the director of the FBI and the chief investigator, and that's already public knowledge. There isn't any question about it. If there's anybody in the United States today that doesn't understand that there apparently is a di disagreement as to whether uh, there's a triggering mechanism that the Attorney General should carry out in the opinion of Mr. Free, Mr. LaBella, and Mr. DeSanto, I think we should wipe that away. There is a disagreement. The question is, why are we now forcing this document? Because this document is feedstock for August, September, and October, and will not be very important in late November, December, or until January, until the Congress goes back. That's the process we're under. Now, framing that up and comparing that to what if we what are they asking us to do, and what problems does it cause if we follow their advice? They're saying, don't ask it now. The process and the timing is premature and improper. Give us a chance to prosecute and complete our conclusions and make our judgments. And then, if we think the Attorney General has done something improper, applied the law improperly, acted improperly, we have the entire next year to study this document and all the facets that the Justice Department carried on through the investigation of campaign finance uh, return. Now, you may say, but we need that independent counsel, and we will do anything. And that's what the chairman is saying. We will do anything to extort or force that attorney general to make the judgment contrary to what she thinks her legal judgment should be. And I say, why? What did we hear from the prosecutor and from the FBI? Mr. Waxman, two days ago, asked him, in your judgment, have you been interfered with by the White House? No. Have you been denied access to any documents or information? No. Have, do you feel that you've, you've carried out this investigation as you could have if you Gentlemen's, were an independent counsel? Yes. The only question is a different jurisdiction. Gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, if I may have just 15 seconds. Well, we're trying to stay very close to it. I, I, if I start allowing everybody to have extra time, then we'll be here. Mr. Chairman, a lot of members of this uh, committee have had. All right, I'll give you 15 seconds. I would urge my colleagues to try and step one, one step backward. Whatever we do here today is going to have no ramifications or implications other than political. But what we do here today will reflect on the integrity of this committee and this Congress for generations. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, I think today is a very significant day on several fronts in Washington. Uh, however, I personally believe that our system of justice and truth uh, will ultimately prevail not only in this committee but in other matters. And I believe that this committee has a, a very important responsibility under the law, under the Constitution, and under the obligations of Congress. The information that we seek uh, uh, from the Attorney General is nothing more than what has been leaked or provided by the Department of Justice to the media. The information we have subpoenaed will not interfere with any specific matter under investigation. This committee 
has an investigative and an oversight responsibility that requires our review of any agency activities. I have the greatest personal respect for Ms. Reno, who I've known for over two decades. But the situation we find ourselves in today is not a matter of friendships, but a matter of law and legal responsibility. We take an oath to faithfully execute our laws. Here's a copy of the Independent Statue Council passed by a Democratic House and Senate and signed into law by President Clinton. Our job is to see that that law is enforced both in letter and in spirit. Two days ago, we heard from the three chief law enforcement officers of our land who were charged with enforcing the law and conducting the investigation relating to the 1996 campaign scandals. These investigators and this committee have uncovered the most significant federal campaign election scandal in the history of our republic. A scandal that we have confirmed involves foreign contributions, including those from a foreign government that may in fact have affected not only our electoral process, but also our national security. A scandal that leads, in their opinion, to the highest office in our land. After being charged to do so, each of these law enforcement officers, and uh, they, they testified to this fact, they reviewed the facts and the law, and without reservation, they recommended to the Attorney General the appointment of an independent counsel. Our FBI director prepared a report. Uh, Mr. Labella prepared a report. They testified that, that both the mandatory and discretionary provisions of the independent counsel law had been met. They further testified that the that the uh, trail of investigation extended again to the highest officials as, re as outlined and required under the independent counsel statute. In fact, the trail leads to the White House and the office of President and Vice President of the United States. Today, no one wants the Attorney General to bow to any political pressure uh, and uh, in, in, a point, in the appointment of a, a, an independent counsel to investigate this matter. Today, no one wants specific case information relating to this criminal investigation. What this committee is doing and what this committee is seeking is first executing its duty and responsibility of congressional oversight, also known as our precious system of checks and balances as required by the Constitution the laws, the rules of, the, uh, of this committee and the charter that outlines the responsibility of this Congress. Finally, what this committee is seeking is not much more than what has been leaked or purposely provided by officials of the Department of Justice. And they're right here in the newspaper. The FBI Director Free, uh, his December 1997 memo and parts of Mr. Labella's July 1998 memos. That's what we have uh, as a responsibility as a congressional re a committee to request of the Attorney General. No more, no less. If me Ms. Reno does not comply, she has made a mockery of the law, a sham of the legal process, and destroyed both the spirit and intent of our system of checks and balances. To sum it up, I've never seen a more compelling situation that demands that we hold an executive officer of our government in contempt uh, of a congressional request for information. If this committee does not act, another, uh, then I think that we have not met our responsibilities under the law and under our system of justice. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Ms. Mal Ms. Ms. Maloney, who's next on your side? Ms. Maloney? Quite frankly, Mr. Chairman, it's been a long week, and today I am feeling a little uh, too old and too tired to sit here and listen to what amounts to harassment 
of the, of the Attorney General, of Attorney General uh, Reno. The Attorney General has asked for three weeks to review the material. Two weeks remain. She has even gone so far to say that she would brief Mr. Burton and Mr. Waxman. We have heard from two distinguished leaders on the other side of the aisle, Senator Orrin Hatch and Congressman Henry Hyde, who have said that a two-week, three-week requested time to review the material is not unreasonable, and they support her request to have a thorough review. In attempting to hold Attorney General Reno in contempt, as usual, Mr. Chairman, you are way out of line and way over the top. I would go further to say that this action that you are suggesting brings this committee to a new low, and we have experienced uh, many lows in this, in this uh, committee. Your suggested, your, your, your suggested, uh, suggested action is, is not only reckless, it, it is really very counterproductive if you want to get to the facts. We, we heard today, or in the testimony, and I think the most important words that we've heard before this committee were the tape of the words of the, the director of the FBI and the, the lead uh, prosecutor and, and the leader of the task force. And all three of these professionals in the Justice Department have asked us not to interfere with their investigation. They have come out and said, please, don't release this information. It will impede our investigation. I mean, that is very clear. And I would go on further to say that it is not only counterproductive to the Justice Department doing their job, but secondly, we do not know what the Attorney General's decision will be in two weeks from now. She may well appoint another special investigator. She's appointed seven. And if we go forward with this action, releasing these documents would hinder the investigation of the special prosecutor that you say you want. So what you're really looking at is not trying to get to the facts or to let the Justice Department move forward professionally with the case. It is just to try to, to, to politicize it. Hold, holding an attorney general in contempt for not turning over internal justi Justice Department documents is, is really uh, ludicrous. Uh, former Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach says the House cannot properly subpoena internal investigative reports or advice from subordinates on such reports. He goes on to say, and I'd like to quote him, indeed, it is hard to imagine a less appropriate subject for a subpoena or one more calculated to politicize the department, end quote. And Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like to put in the record letters from former attorney generals opposing this committee's attempt to hold Attorney General Janet Reno in contempt. It is inappropriate, it is reckless, and it is counterproductive. And I urge a no vote on this misguided uh, direction that you want to take. Gentlelady yields back the balance for time. Mr. Davis. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me just make a few comments. Um, I think it's interesting to note that my friends on the other side of the aisle are great to quote uh, Mr. Freed and Mr. LaBella when it suits their purposes, but they're only telling half the story when they do that. Of course, both of these individuals have recommended um, an independent counsel in this case. Uh, by the way, Chairman Hyde, uh, who we've spoken to, is in support of what we are doing. We are united, I think, on this side of the aisle and going after and trying to get the truth behind this. And as we've seen so often in this committee, uh, every time we reach a crisis point, uh, we see the stalling, the stonewalling, the delay, and then attacking the accusers. And we heard it today where they're going after our uh, chairman uh, uh, once again or attempts to switch the subject. Uh, we saw it in the uh, firing of the travel office in Billy Dale. Uh, we saw 
it, it, later, in fact, we found out some of the attacks that came through there were filtered from the White House to committee members on the other side. We've seen it with the FBI files. Uh, we saw it with the uh, White House database, and it has been a constant drain uh, in these areas. Um, the Attorney General is, of course, the President's political appointee and is surrounded by political appointees in the Justice Department right around her. And in fact, it is with these political appointees she's been conferring on these memorandums, not Mr. LaBella or Mr. Free who wrote them. Uh, Webb Hubble, of course, was one of the key political appointees over there at one time. I think that underscores the fact that the administration is not without significant influence over there at the Justice Department if decisions are made. And that's why this is even, to me, uh, we, we feel like we have a duty to find out what is really motivating the Attorney General in this case, who has been surrounded by uh, political appointees uh, and not facing up to the recommendations made by the professionals over there, Mr. Free and Mr. LaBella uh, and uh, others. Um, two provisions of the Independent Counsel Law, one mandatory, the other discretionary, really determine when an Attorney General should ask a special three-member panel of federal judges to name an independent counsel. Uh, the mandatory provision is triggered when, if you want to quote the Attorney General, there are allegations of sufficiently specific and, cr and credible to constitute grounds to investigate whether an individual covered by an independent counsel law may have violated federal criminal law. Now, the discretionary provision is triggered whenever an appearance of conflict of interest precludes the Justice Department from conducting uh, an objective investigation. I don't think there are any of us who have looked at this that don't see that the second uh, provision is met, that in point of fact there is an appearance of a conflict of interest that really precludes the Justice Department in this case from conducting an objective investigation. But that's discretionary. What is more alarming is Mr. LaBella in his testimony had said that he felt the mandatory sections of this statute were met in his memorandum. And I think we have an obligation to look at that memorandum to be able to evaluate that so we can decide is there obstruction of justice, is there political motivation, why in the world is the Attorney General alone, it seems, among the legal independent uh, uh, or the independent advisors around here advising against an independent counsel? That's our oversight responsibility. We should make no apologies for that. I think we owe that to the people who have uh, elected us. Uh, on Tuesday, we heard Mr. Free, uh, who had, uh, I think, last year encouraged the Attorney General to seek an independent counsel, left no doubt about his current position uh, when he outlined uh, to, to her in a memorandum uh, last fall. Uh, he told the committee that he had concluded that the investigation in which over 100, 100 FBI agents and other officials conducted over 3,000 interviews, they've served over 1,900 subpoenas, that they uncovered a core group of individuals who, in the view of the uh, head of the FBI, are indisputably covered persons under the independent counsel statute. He was asked by Chairman Burton uh, if he was referring to the White House, and Mr. Free responded yes in a much larger context than the White House. Now, does that include the president or the vice president, the chairman asked. Yes, sir, Mr. Free replied. And as the discretionary provision of the independent counsel law, as we said before, uh, Mr. Free told the committee that some individuals being investigated by the Justice Department posed a personal, financial, or political uh, conflict of interest. So I think you have both of these criteria met. We have an obligation to move forward. I might also add that in this committee's deliberations on the same the antenna should have gone up because we have had over 100 witnesses have either fled the country or taken the Fifth Amendment. So there is a lot going on here. Mr. LaBella, whom uh, Ms. Reno uh, personally selected last fall to uh, head her department, uh, reached similar conclusions, and he has issued a memorandum which has been leaked selectively to uh, press outlets throughout the country. I think we have an obligation to be able to look at that, not to get some of the information they feel is sensitive is going to upset the pattern for their um, uh, investigation, but because we have an obligation uh, to move uh, forward. Let me just say, uh, in, in conclusion on this, that it seems to me uh, we have an obligation to proceed and to get this information. There are a lot of queries going around this town and the country over what's happening, and is the Justice Department, in fact, covering up? And when you get the only objective people over there coming to unanimous conclusions that the statute mandatorily covers them, we have an obligation to pursue that. So for that reason, I'm going to support the chairman's motion on this. I think you'll see very strong uh, support for that over on this side. And I think history will prove that we uh, moved in the right direction. I yield back.
Gentlemen's time has expired. M Mr. Barrett, do you want to uh, take your time now or, or wait till we come back for the vote? I would prefer to wait till we come back. If All right, uh, the chair, uh, the, the committee. I'd be glad to go now. Well, uh, if he wants to go now, I, I would right, yield Mr. to him Patel, and take we'll his time. We'll recognize you for five minutes and then uh, we'll recess uh, until the vote's concluded and then Thank we'll get back Chairman. as quickly as and, possible. And I'll try not to take uh, the complete five minutes. Hey, Let me Patel. say that um, many of my fair minded friends on the other side of our I think been fairly articulate in trying to indicate why they uh, want to have uh, us move to hold in contempt the Attorney General. And the gentleman from California laid out what he seemed to be a fairly straightforward process in which it's pretty clear that there should be an independent counsel. The problem is, is that when you really look at the statute, what it says is that you have to have specific and credible evidence that one of the covered people has committed a crime in order to trigger under the mandatory provision. And what the Attorney General is saying is that they've been looking at campaign irregularities. They've, in fact, indicted and convicted a couple of people uh, who were involved in the 96 election, both on the Republican side of the aisle, who paid multi-million dollar fines and have been had other sentences imposed on them. There have also been 11 indictments of people on the Democratic side, and that this grand jury is proceeding Forward. We know, for instance, through the AP story uh, that I talked about yesterday, that the Republican National Committee, for instance, has claimed attorney-client privilege over 95 documents that they don't want to submit to this grand jury. We know that there is a, a lot of back and forth around people connected with the uh, Democratic National Committee. And Mr. LaBella, uh, Director Free, and Attorney General Reno are pursuing aggressively these irregularities. but. It is apparent, at least in the Attorney General's hesitancy, that there doesn't appear at the moment to be specific or credible evidence that one of the covered people has committed a specific violation of law. And she's also said that she hasn't made a final decision on that matter, that she is reviewing the evidence that has been compiled by the task force. And so to say that it's an automatic open and shut case that we should have an independent counsel, I don't think is there. But nonetheless, I do think we should appreciate the fact that there is a very aggressive investigation going on. Maybe we appreciate it too much. Maybe what we are seeing is some sensitivity to the fact that the Justice Department's investigation doesn't seem to be solely focused on Democratic fundraising. It seems to be focused on campaign irregularities that rise to the level of illegalities no matter whether the person or persons involved are Republicans or Democrats. And we know that, you know, when you start calling major Republican figures before the grand jury, as we've seen with Haley uh, Barber in this $2 million transaction from Hong Kong that was funneled through uh, in the 1994 elections into 60 congressional races and some of these other issues, that maybe there's some sensitivity to how aggressive and how straightforward Attorney General Reno in this investigation is, and that I would just hope that as we go about this, uh, this uh, contempt citation, that what we're really not saying is that we hold in contempt anyone that we disagree with. And what I was suggesting earlier is that this committee, in its one-sided approach to this matter, all of the subpoenas, all of the uh, efforts of this committee to find it wrongdoing seem to be focused on the Democratic Party when I think the, the American people are well aware that all of the angels are not on one side and all of the wrongdoers are not on one side in this matter, and that what we need is a fair, straightforward investigation. Maybe the Attorney General will find that we need an independent counsel, and maybe that's the correct decision. She's made that decision uh, on other occasions when I disagree with her um, in the matters related to uh, Secretary Cisneros or. Uh, sec former late Secretary Ron Brown, or in the case of Secretary Alexis Herman, uh, decisions that, uh, for those of us on the Democratic side of the aisle, we felt were may maybe perhaps a little too hasty. Now we have a circumstance where you think that she's a little too hesitant. But I think, nonetheless, she's proven to be quite independent, quite capable, and I don't think any of us would want, because subordinates of ours have a different opinion, for our right to make the final and ultimate decision even if it is to cast an unwise vote, like to hold the, the Attorney General of the United States in contempt, to have that decision taken away from us to be our ultimate final uh, responsibility that we make. And I don't think that we should do the same 
um, in terms of the Attorney General. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The, the committee will stand in recess to the fall of the gavel. And please try to get back as quickly as possible so we can wrap this up. The committee will reconvene. Members will be drifting back in uh, from the vote on the floor, but I'd like to keep this moving so we can conclude as quickly as possible. Uh, we'll next recognize Mr. Souter, and then uh, we'll go to Mr. Barrett. Mr. Souter. First of all, I want to uh, express a, a few words of uh, sympathy for my Democratic colleagues. It is not easy uh, year after year not knowing what bomb is going to drop the next day in this committee. Uh, we have gone through multiple investigations and <coughs> they uh, will make excuses for the administration and then some new piece of information comes out. So I realize it's a very difficult position. My uh, friend and colleague from Pennsylvania uh, in the last statement said that uh, he felt that there should be a, uh, that the Attorney General should pursue both parties in campaign finance question. It's clear as he pointed out in his own statement that in fact they have pursued both parties. The question is, in an independent consul um, uh, in, uh, question here is, is whether or not you trust a Democratic president and a Democratic attorney general to prosecute Republicans. Quite frankly, most taxpayers believe that there isn't an inherent conflict of interest in the Democratic president, Democratic vice president, Democratic attorney general, Democratic Justice Department in their unwillingness to prosecute Republicans. But there is a question of conflict of interest at least at the highest levels among the Democrats. And I want to give the Attorney General credit where credit's due. Thus far, we've had independent counsels for the Whitewater investigation. We've had an independent counsel for investigation of the AmeriCorps chief. We've had an independent counsel for the investigation of the Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Espy. We've had an independent counsel for the investigation of the Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown. We've had an independent counsel for the investigation of the Secretary of Labor, Alexis Herman. We've had an independent counsel for the investigation of the Secretary of HUD, Henry Cisneros. We've had an independent counsel for the investigation of the Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt. Now, when it starts to move up the food chain, which is what we've constantly been seeing, it isn't that there isn't problems, because the Attorney General has acknowledged that thus, thus far 
five cabinet members of this administration have so far had enough evidence come forth that they need an independent consul. But when it came to the Vice President of the United States, she didn't rule that there needed to be an independent consul. Now, my friends on the other side of the aisle have followed a pattern that was alluded to earlier. When we started this whole investigation under Chairman Klinger, we were wandering around in a travel office investigation, which at the time seemed fairly small. And their answer was, don't investigate this as a witch hunt. We're picking on a small office. We're doing this for political purposes. But then it came out that friends of Bill, such as the Thomases and Dick Morris, were wandering around the White House, and where did they get their passes? So they maintained that it was a witch hunt until we learned that the way we got these big security files, this massive list of, of files that, um, of people and how they were getting clearances and that type of background. But that was a witch hunt. And we were doing this investigation. We had to push to get every information there. That led us into the Craig Livingstone investigation. Who hired him? And, and different people denying that they hired him. They basically said maybe Vince Foster hired him. Uh, and we went through this roundabout thing. And so that was a big witch hunt until, in the process of going through these, this big stack of files, we saw little codes by their names. Now, how do people, when we constantly hear that this committee has accomplished nothing, we've already gone through the travel office, which has led to many investigations. We've gone through the files, which is a continuing investigation. We've got into the data bank question now. And every time, at each step, this was a witch hunt. There was nothing there. This committee doesn't anything. Chairman Klinger was, was not an effective chairman, and this committee was an appalling partisan committee. Then Chairman Burton is an appalling partisan chairman. But the fact is, this committee then unturned a data bank. And what does that data bank mean? Well, there were little codes by people's names. What did those codes mean? Well, one was the Lincoln bedroom. How do you think the information came out about the Lincoln bedroom? How do you think the information came out about the White House coffees and the White House being used as a cash machine for the Democratic Party? So, well, that's a little different, but as we move through the data bank question, we started to find numerous traces of, okay, in this data bank, how did these names get in there? Where is this money? And then in the process of looking at the money, we see money from Indian tribes and Indian uh, people who are, are representatives of those tribes, and that leads eventually into an investigation of an independent council with the Secretary of Interior. We are in the process of trying to pursue foreign money that moved in through, as we see, oh, this person got in to a, a, a radio show. Oh, this person had a picture with the president. Oh, this person got in a Lincoln bedroom. Oh, they weren't an American citizen. Then an amazing thing happened. 112 people have either pled the Fifth Amendment or fled this country, 112 people. How in the world can you do an investigation with 112 people saying that if they testify in front of this committee, they will incriminate themselves, that they might go to jail if they talk? Now, I don't have the faith who's in an attorney general who's already said that she will not uh, put an independent counsel for the vice president to be neutral in this question, particularly when the director of the FBI, all the key principals in this, have said to her, there is a conflict of interest, mandatory and discretionary. You are a political appointee. You are a political party representative. You've got to get out of this. And that I believe we have the responsibility for the American people to say we need to know specifically what is in this document because we have lost faith in this government's willingness to go to its highest level and to probe this. And the proof is nearly four years of being stonewalled, 112 people who will not testify to this committee and us trying to get to the truth of has our political system been corrupted. This is not about address. We haven't had one hearing on Monica Lewinsky. This is about serious potential corruption of our government. I yield back. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time, uh, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, one of the earlier speakers today on the other side talked about the, the high drama that, that filled this room. Looking at this room, just sensing the high drama here, um, I'm wondering maybe I'm in the wrong room uh, because there's no high drama in this room. Everybody knows what's going on here. I think anybody watching this would, would say, what's wrong with this picture? Because there's something fundamentally wrong here when we look at what, what the different actors are saying. Um, the people on that side of the aisle are saying that we're, we're interested in covering up. We're trying to, to guard the president, to try to do everything we can to stonewall the American people. But then I, then I look at the comments that Mr. Labella made, and I'm going to have to read them again to make sure that I'm not missing something. because. Mr. Labella is the person who has done more 
colleague than anybody else uh, to bring the investigation as far as it's, as it's come. And in his own words, he's put his blood, sweat, and tears into this investigation. And what has he asked this committee? He's asked this committee, please don't, please don't release the memorandum. Please don't ruin my investigation. Now, if I were trying to cover up something, and if I were trying to ruin the investigation, I would think that I, along with every other member of the Democratic Party, would say, release these documents. Um, but we're not saying that. We're saying, let's, let's continue this process. We're agreeing with Senator Hatch. We're saying, let's, let's have some, some bipartisanship. Let's have some respect for each other. Let's have some respect for the process. Let's have some respect for the mutual institutions. And maybe we can work this out. This is what Mr. LaBella said, and you've heard it before, but it bears repeating. The last thing, and I'm quoting, the last thing in the world that I want to see as the prosecutor heading this task force is that this memo ever get disclosed. I'll go beyond three weeks. I don't think it should ever see the light of the day because this is, in my, this, in my judgment, would be devastating to the investigation that the men and women of the task force, that the men and women of the task force are working on right now, and that I put my blood, sweat, and tears into, and I don't want to see that jeopardized. I would even be stronger than the director, he's referring to Director Free there. I can't see a set of circumstances under which this report should see the light of day. Now this is the person who cares more about this than anybody in this room, because he's the one who's basically put his career on the line um, and has, has issued a memorandum the Attorney General. And he's coming to us and saying, please don't jeopardize my investigation. And again, I have to make this point because I'm wondering what's wrong with this picture. If, if the Democrats are so interested, as, as my friends on the Republican side say, if we're so interested in, in screwing up this investigation, we'd be tripping over each other to have this, to have this, this memorandum released. But it's the other side who's saying, let's make it public. Now this sort of brings to my mind, and I don't know what the room looks like off the floor on the Republican side, but I have this view of a, of a room, um, and Maxwell Smart is sitting in this room from Get Smart, the old television show. And they're talking about how can we outsmart each other? How can we do this? And the whole thing is about embarrassing the, uh, the Attorney General. It's not about justice. It's not about the seeking of truth. It's what can we do to have a, a bad headline for the Attorney General of the United States. So, and the reasoning, I assume, as I'm trying to figure this out, is to put political pressure on the Attorney General so that she will capitulate to the political demands of the chairman and the majority side. Now, that's not the way that justice is done in this country, and I don't think that we want justice in this country, frankly, pushed by Democratic leanings or Republican leanings. And we hear the claims that somehow they're, they're a cover-up, but we've got time. Senator Hatch doesn't sense the high drama that is supposedly filling this room. Um, as we look at the editorials from around the country, they're sort of baffled by this. They don't understand, although maybe some of the people who watch this, com this committee for the last two years understand only too well, um, because it has been a, a comedy of errors. But we're well beyond the point of having this committee taken seriously. Um, and I think what we should do is let's just vote on it. Let's just get it over with. And then we can go on to the next chapter. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. McIntosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me say I agree with the comments of my colleague from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Uh, this committee has done a tremendous job in producing evidence that is very relevant about this entire matter. But I want to focus my remarks today on the core question that we're really being called upon to vote on. And that is, should we hold the Attorney General of the United States in contempt of this committee. This is an historic moment. Never before has a cabinet member in this country been held in contempt of Congress. It is the utmost in shame. It is an indication that she has failed to discharge her duties under the Constitution. I think the committee is justified in voting that contempt. Frankly, my message to Attorney General Reno is shame on you. You are the highest law enforcement officer in the land. You've taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. That means that you will govern by the rule of law. 
not impose your will, your judgment, your decisions, which if you look at Ms. Reno's testimony and statements to the press over the past few days, is exactly what she says she intends to do. The testimony that we heard from Mr. Free and Mr. Le said two things that were very important. The first was there were a core group of officials in the White House about which there is evidence they committed a crime, and that that included the President and the Vice President of the United States. That's very serious. Let me repeat it again. There is a core group of officials in the White House about which there is evidence that they may have committed a crime, including the President and the Vice President of the United States. The second point, and I believe it was Mr. Labella who made this, is that under the independent counsel law, Attorney General Reno has no discretion. There is one section about the conflict of interest where she does have discretion. There is another section where there is evidence of a crime by certain officials about which she has no discretion. It is her duty to appoint an independent counsel. She has failed to do, do so, and that is the reason that this committee is insisting upon receiving those documents. The bottom line is the Attorney General has failed to uphold her oath to uphold the Constitution. Shame on you, Mrs. Reno, for substituting your view and putting yourself above the law in this land. Shame on you for refusing to appoint an independent counsel. Shame on you for refusing to acknowledge a clear conflict of interest because the President appoints you he can fire you, and you're the one refusing to appoint an independent counsel. It's clear as day to anybody who looks at that that you have a conflict of interest. Shame on you for ignoring the advice of the highest career officials in this country in the Criminal Law Enforcement Division. I wholeheartedly support Chairman Burton's effort and this committee's vote today to hold the Attorney General in contempt of this committee. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'd like Mr. McIntosh to, to quote from us from the record where it says that uh, the Vice President or the President committed a crime, because I, I don't remember hearing that, and I don't think that's accurate. I'll gladly share with you a transcript of the he hearing. Because it's not accurate, today. Mr. McIntosh. Uh, let me go on. Let me, you know, one of the things that um, I've listened to all the testimony and what has been said here this morning. And I think that we're missing the point. The, you know, it's interesting, I, I, everything I've heard, I've, I've not heard one syllable from the other side that goes to the very significant points that Mr. Free, and Mr. LaBella and Mr. DiCerno said basically what they have said, and this is what we're all about here today, and, and maybe we're, we, we, we've gotten too far afield, but what they have said was is that they don't want the report released. They think it's the worst thing that could ever happen in the world. Nobody's addressing that. And the reason why no one is addressing it is because it creates a major problem. On the one hand, we have the other side saying, you know, we like their opinion. We want the Attorney General to do what they say. They are great men. They are very credible. And so that's all well and good. But on the other hand, when they say, look, we don't think that this report should be released, then nobody even deals with that. And that is the key question here. Should the report be released? You can talk about contempt. You can talk about all kinds of stuff, but the bottom line is, should the report be released? Now, as I listened, I was hoping someone would say, I mean, as a lawyer, and I'm used to kind of thinking of arguments three or four paces ahead, and the closest person that came to saying this was Mr. Cox, and he said when he talked about redacting the report, well, the problem with redacting the report is the witnesses have already said that the testimony, that the, the facts and the law are so intertwined in the report that it's almost impossible to do. And so, therefore, we're left with still the bottom line. Now, you can sit here and talk about history all you want. I wasn't here three years ago. 
You can talk about what this committee has done all you want, but that's not the issue here today. Let's deal with the issue that we are dealing with today. Everybody talks about the high moment. This is a great, this is a great day. This is a unique day. Okay, fine. Why is it a unique day? Because we're talking about finding an attorney general in contempt for not releasing a report that the FBI director says would, one of, would be one of the greatest, one of the worst things that could ever happen. As a matter of fact, he used the words that it would send a chilling message. Those are some heavy words. It will send a chilling message. And what he's saying is that when you send a message out from this committee, and I have, I'm not going to knock the chairman. I believe that his, his, his intentions are probably honorable. I'm not going to knock the other side. But I'm going to tell you one thing, that it, I, I have to believe that all of us were elected to lift up the people of this great United States of America. I think all of us were elected that if we see wrong, to address it. Well, when you've got the FBI director telling you that this act could fly in the face of what we've been elected to do, I don't understand what we're doing. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody has addressed that. That is so interesting to me. And, 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 and I challenge you to address what they've said. The, 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 the words of Mr. LaBella, when I looked at his face, I mean, he looked as if, I mean, it was it, it like, I cannot imagine you doing this. You cannot do it. As a matter of fact, when I, when I watched him, I said to myself, I said, you know, they're making a great case for not finding the Attorney General in contempt. These are the witnesses that were called by the Republican side. And I think that we, that you have made a great case. And so it's not about, we is not trying to hide anything. The Cerno is not trying to hide anything. Uh, and certainly LaBella is not trying to hide anything. But what they have said is that if you do this, then you do something that flies in the face of the very thing that we are trying to achieve, of all the work that we put into this effort, of all the people that may be down the line to be prosecuted. Now, now, if you do this, you're doing us in, and I refuse to be a part of that. I yield back the balance. Gentleman, gentleman yields back the balance this time. Uh, Mr. Shaddy. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and uh, I'm thrilled to follow the last speaker who raised the very issue I want to talk about. I want to make a very important point here. We are here not because of the conduct of this committee. We are here not because this committee leaked the existence of the free memo and the conclusion of the free memo, or leaked the existence of the LaBella memo or the conclusion of the LaBella memo. You know, a couple of years back on, on vacation, my wife and my daughter bought me a poster that said, take responsibility for every aspect of your life. I want to suggest the Attorney General of the United States is responsible for us being here today and she is not taking responsibility for her prosecutorial malpractice. Mr. LaBella testified point blank that he made three copies. One for himself, and he clearly didn't leak it. One for Mr. Free, and I don't believe he leaked it. And then he made one for the Attorney General, and we heard testimony that she made at least nine copies. The fact is, the existence of the LaBella memo the existence of the free memo was leaked by the Department of Justice and its employees. They leaked it. These stories, beginning July 23, detail the contents of those memos. We are here because she already leaked the report. And she says the fundamental argument here is, oh my God, don't jeopardize our investigation by even asking for a copy of these memos. Had she put one one thousandth of the energy into keeping the existence of this important memo from being leaked and the conclusion from being leaked, we wouldn't be here. But her position is, oh, I'm going to let the American people know that in this matter going to criminal conduct by the White House and the President, they can know the conclusion because of one of my advisors, but they can't see the context. They can know the conclusion because I negligently supervised my department and allowed it to be leaked. But what's her response? Let's talk about the arrogance of her response. She's responsible, her department's responsible for the leak. And how does she respond? Well, these repress reports deal her, detail her response. Does she say, I'm outraged that a confidential prosecution memo which should never go public was leaked by my department? Does she announce an investigation to find out 
who leaked the existence of the report and the conclusion that Mr. LaBella reached. No, she does not. What she says arrogantly in these stories is, I don't care. I don't care if Mr. LaBella said I should appoint an independent investigator. I will listen to the opinions of other people, and I will make my own decisions. Does she express any outrage at the malpractice of her department for leaking this information so the American people know that the three people most knowledgeable about this investigation have all said to her, you shall, you should, you must appoint an independent counsel? No, she doesn't care about that. She doesn't announce an investigation into their malpractice. She says, you, you, the committee, are wrong if you release it. It's okay for me to commit malpractice. Madam Attorney General, take responsibility for every aspect of your life. You leaked it. Your department leaked it. And now the American people want to know what's in it. You know what? All this committee is asking is that the committee get to see what's in it. But that's not her answer. Finally, let's talk about could she respond on the merits. This committee responsibly said, Madam Attorney General, we want the document. And, and we cited to her a series of cases, one after another, in which we said, in the past, congressional committees have asked for confidential, internal Department of Justice memoranda in ongoing cases. And we provided her conscientiously, and I compliment our lawyers, with a long list of those cases. Now, did the Attorney General respond conscientiously and say, well, let's have a discussion about the merits of the law in this area, about the right of your committee to have this in the exercise of its oversight jurisdiction. Absolutely not. What she wrote us back was a letter in which she said, I know that you've cited several examples that you believe contradict the opinion she's relying on. But we've analyzed your examples, and none of them deal with the demand you have made. Does she discuss our cases? Does she distinguish them? Does she tell the committee that we are wrong? Absolutely not. In a, in a four-page long letter, she puts in a perfunctory paragraph that says, no, you're not entitled to them. Yes, there is something wrong with this picture. The Attorney General commits prosecutorial malpractice. Mr. Free, Mr. LaBella, and Mr. DeSarno all implored us not to make these public. But what did they do to make sure they didn't go public? And this is not the first time. In December of this year, the Free Memo went public. And the Attorney General knew it was public. And Mr. Free, and the Attorney General implored this committee not to demand a copy of that memo, not to compromise this investigation. Same argument they're making now. Having made that huge mistake then, allowing that memo to be leaked, they once again leak another memo. This, these stories quote um, a great deal of detail about what's in the LaBella La memo and its reasoning. And yet, when the second leak occurs of the LaBella memo, does she say, I goofed? Does she say, I made a mistake? Does she say, I deplore the conduct of my department, and I understand the American people would like to see these documents? No. She says, you can't have them, and beyond that, I don't care what Bella said. I'll talk to the people I want to talk to, and I'll make my own decision. This is tragic that the Attorney General of the United States has put us in this sad position as a result of her own malpractice. She should take responsibility for leaking these memos and putting this committee in this spot. And if necessary, we should investigate her for incompetence in allowing her department to leak what she now says is critically sensitive information, which if we even get a copy of, will compromise the investigation. Why didn't she think about that and stop the leak before it occurred? Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you. Uh, I, I would, uh, before I begin, suggest to the uh, previous speaker that uh, if he has any real evidence that the Attorney General has uh, leak the memo. He ought to uh, bring that evidence before. Will the gentleman yield? Committee. No, I will not. It's uh, it's not inappropriate for Mr. Burton to insist on accountability. Uh, that is his right as the, as a chair, and that is our right as members of this committee to insist on accountability from the executive branch. But in seeking accountability, we must be very very careful not to engage in an ironically historic misuse of the power of this committee to force the hand of the Attorney General, who has the responsibility to make sure that justice, not politics, is served. I submit that the action which this committee would take becomes not a show of force, but just a show, not a sign of strength, but a sign of weakness. <coughs> a contempt citation ought to be absolutely the last resort of this committee only after every possible avenue has been explored. 
and we have not. Only after all doubts have been dispelled. They have not. Only after the most obviously, blatantly unreasonable conduct should we even begin such a discussion. Now let's return to the facts. The director of the FBI and the head of the Justice Department campaign finance investigation have both publicly insisted there ought to be an independent counsel to investigate campaign finance. This is a decision which is Ms. Reno's to make. The same two men who have called for an independent counsel, however, also say that the release of those documents which they believe would make the case for an independent counsel would jeopardize an ongoing criminal investigation. Now let's review what they've said. They've said, yes, we want an independent counsel. No, we don't believe Congress ought to have the information why we happen to believe there ought to be an independent counsel. Uh, frankly, I don't believe that's a very strong testimony for us to proceed with contempt. Uh, the Attorney General, for her part, has, has offered to uh, privately brief the chair and the ranking member. She's offered to come before this committee to explain her decision after she makes a review of, of, the, uh, uh, of the advice given her by Justice Department officials. Now, that sounds reasonable. Uh, if she releases critical information before she concludes her review, then this committee would inappropriately or could inappropriately attempt to enter into the prosecutorial process. Now, let's look at the choice which this committee would give the Attorney General. This committee would insist that Ms. Reno give it documents which even those in the Justice Department who disagree with her say that such a release would jeopardize an ongoing investigation. Ms. Reno is being given a choice. Protect the investigation or protect herself. Now, the American public should have increased confidence in the courage of Attorney General Janet Reno that she would take the risk of being cited for contempt of Congress rather than relinquish the respons her responsibility to protect an ongoing investigation and the rights of those under investigation. And we have a long history here of leaks that have come from this committee process. Although, although there may be many people in America who would feel that the last thing in America we need is an indi another independent counsel, uh, Ms. Reno has, as we have seen in the case of Mr. Starr, permitted an independent counsel, extraordinary free reign. She knows now the uh, un unlimitation of such power. She knows how important it is to be judicious <laughs> in the use of such power to appoint an independent prosecutor. Now, Mr. Cox earlier had asked, how does Congress do oversight over the Attorney General if we can't ask her about her decision? It's an interesting question. I would ask, what questions may this Congress ask of an independent counsel about the process of his or her investigation? And who is the check on an independent counsel? Does anyone in America believe that an independent counsel is either independent or accountable to anyone? I mean, look at the independent counsel, Mr. Starr. Uh, clients, General Motors, Meineke, um, Meineke at the same time that he's prosecuting the president. The Attorney General is accountable. She is accountable based on her reputation, based on her publicly demonstrated ethos, her integrity, her gravitas, her deliberation, her judiciousness, and her appointed position. How could anyone assert another independent counsel would be more independent and more accountable and more in control? There is an element, as has been stated here, of theatricality to these proceedings. I submit it's not high drama, it's low comedy. We see members in rows and cameras in rows and lights and sound and reporters and observers and viewers and people watching with great interest what we do. The question just what will Congress do? Will we hold Janet Reno in contempt? Well, we have the power to hold the Attorney General in contempt. But in the end, it may be this committee which is held in contempt because we have overreached to damage the Justice Department, to, da to damage public confidence in law enforcement, and to damage an attorney general who is doing her job without fear, without favor, and without help from this committee. I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance this time, Mr. La Tourette. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, and, and just to my good friend and colleague from uh, Cleveland, the, uh, the attorney general supervises the independent counsel, and so does the three-judge panel. I uh, have had the, uh, I've enjoyed this debate with a couple of exceptions. I think it's been a good debate on this issue. Uh, I fear, though, that the, the issue of um, the Attorney General's discretion on the question of should she appoint an independent counsel versus uh, should there be a contempt citation have been blurred 
uh, unnecessarily. I had the pleasure before this service of, of being an elected prosecutor. I issued subpoenas. I presented cases to Pettit and grand juries. I had to seek uh, citations of contempt when people didn't show up. And I don't, think, I don't know if I would agree with the observation that this is historic or momentous or anything else. And I would uh, say that if Mr. Burton was trying to grab some headlines, he picked the wrong day because I think Ms. Lewinsky is going to get better coverage down at the federal courthouse today. But I consider this to be a serious step. I don't think that you go out and seek a contempt citation uh, without cause. But I think it's also a critical step that needs to be taken when people ignore the institutions within our elected government that are authorized to issue uh, subpoenas. And here, the authority is vested in us to have oversight responsibility. I, I haven't heard anybody yet quibble with the fact that the United States Code says that uh, if you don't uh, respond to a subpoena issued by the United States Congress, you can be held uh, in contempt. It's a violation. It's punished. It can be uh, criminal sanction. I also haven't heard anyone dispute that there are only a couple of validly recognized reasons why you can ignore a subpoena. One, Mr. Cox mentioned executive privilege. Uh, the other one deals with the fact that the committee doesn't have jurisdiction over the subject matter. I guess that's another uh, defense that's recognized. But if this Congress or, or the courts uh, of this land permit people to choose to not uh, follow subpoenas for reasons other than are accepted under the law, I, I think our system of justice is irreparably damaged. And if Mrs. Reno can ignore a subpoena, then, then why should Joe Sixpack back in Ohio, who's been summoned to court for a DWI, uh, have to show up. Why would the litigant in a divorce case where the issue is child support and supporting the children of a marriage uh, supply his, a copy of his pay stub to prove what it is that, that he or she makes so that the judge can set child support? Well, it can't be done. And I, I, I appreciate the Attorney General's contacting the chairman of the committee, but the offer that was made is laughable because in that divorce situation, if the litigant says, well, I know I got your subpoena, I'm supposed to bring in my paycheck, but I'll tell you what, Rather than bringing in my pay stub, I'll just come in and tell you about what I make in my job, and you figure out how you're going to set child support based upon our conversation. That, that's not a serious offer, sadly, by the Attorney General, uh, and, that's, and that's sad. This, this motion today, uh, in contempt, the Attorney General has the ability to purge just like any other litigant. Uh, she doesn't have three weeks that she's asked for. She's going to have five weeks while Congress is in recess uh, to uh, do the right thing before this uh, matter moves to the court. But she's not going to have the opportunity to run out the clock on the Congress. I, I made the observation yesterday that the reason that baseball is America's pastime is you've got to get 27 outs, and then you're done with the game. In football and basketball, you've got a 60-minute clock. And sadly, I fear that if we don't take this action today, responsible action, the Attorney General is going to hope that the clock expires on the 105th Congress. I, I would suggest that the discussion should be, and I, I am very mindful of the opinion of Director Free and Mr. LaBella, this discussion shouldn't be about whether or not uh, the Attorney General is in contempt, because clearly she is. She received a subpoena, she didn't follow it, and she has no legal excuse to avoid it. The question that I would hope that the Chairman of our committee and the ranking member, Mr. Waxman, who I have great respect for, would be to sit down and engage in a conversation with the Attorney General as to how we protect the security of this report. Because all of our friends on the other side have talked about made public, made public, made public. I think it would be a horrible thing if this report was public in light of the, the observations of these fine law enforcement officials. So if, if, if the ranking member and the chairman of this committee can't sit down and figure out how we can keep this report secret to preserve the integrity of the investigation while at the same time permitting us to do our oversight responsibilities to see if, in fact, the attorney general is ignoring the responsibilities that she has under law, then maybe we should get a new ranking member and new chairman, because I, I think that that's really where the conversation should be. And that's how this thing can be solved in a nonpartisan, bipartisan way. And let's get this show on the road. A and I heard people on the other side talk about leaking like sieves and so forth and so on. And I know a man was passed out to the press. It's my recollection that, that at least for the Webb Hubble tapes, and maybe I'm wrong, but that the protocol, is, uh, we eventually set up some working group. And I thought the working group authorized the release of those. So, so and, and again, when I was a prosecutor, if someone didn't follow a subpoena, we sent the sheriff out and we did a habeas grabus and we brought him to the courthouse. If one of my assistants leaked grand jury information, we fired him and we prosecuted him. And if we can't figure out that same system here to protect the integrity of this report, then we got the wrong people Gen serving yield. on this committee. Wait, 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 I'm, the I'm almost yield. out of time, but wait, I'll yield, yield to, uh, to the chairman, and then I'd like to yield to the ranking member. Let me just say real quickly that uh, when we were made privy to uh, parts of the Louis Free memo last December, it was understood that none of that would be leaked and it would be held in confidence. Uh, Mr. Free stated very clearly before this committee, uh, day before yesterday, 
that none of that was leaked, and I think we can comply with the gentleman's request. I'd, I'd like to, whatever time, I'd like to yield to Mr. Wagner. I thank you for yielding to me. I think it's reasonable uh, what you suggest, that the Attorney General be able to come in and to talk to us about what's in that memo so that we don't have any breach of confidentiality. But let me just put it this, to you, this way to you. If I were chairman of the committee and I was going to subpoena uh, documents from Jackie Bennett, who works for Ken Starr, as to recommendations he makes to Ken Starr, I think people would scream with outrage that I was trying to get investigative materials. There's a hundred-year precedent that Congress is not entitled to investigative materials from the Department of Justice. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Blagojevich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I could just offer an independent, a, a viewpoint of an independent third party, and that is a newspaper from the heartland of America, the Chicago Tribune, which I know you, from time to time, I must imagine you've read, and uh, comes from our area, from the Midwest, the Chicago Tribune, which happens to be, I think it's fair to say, more Republican than Democrat. It's a, it's a paper that began during the Civil War uh, as an organ that supported Abraham Lincoln, and over the last century and a half has been a paper that has been uh, not only growing in uh, circulation, but also uh, a paper, as I've said, that has tended to be a little bit more Republican uh, than Democrat. Uh, and let me say, too, uh, before I just talk about what the Tribune in its editorial today said uh, about the previous speaker, the Los Angeles Times, I believe, was referenced earlier, uh, um, asking us to kind of look to some more tempered members of the Republican side. And I just want to commend the previous speaker for his reasoned uh, discussion on this particular issue. It's very hard uh, when one particular side you know, is supporting that party's position and those of us on this side support our party's position. And I think the voice of independent third parties like newspapers across the country, um, I think can be very good, strong arguments for the kind of course that we ought to take. In the Tribune today, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Chicago Tribune suggested that you take the advice of both uh, FBI Director Louis Freed and Mr. LaBella, two people who uh, have agreed with you that there ought to be a, an appointment of a special prosecutor and refrain from compelling them to release memoranda that's private and that could very well uh, put this ultimate investigation in jeopardy. Uh, to quote from the Tribune, they say that, quote, uh, they think Janet Reno should heed the advice of those subordinates who've investigated alleged campaign finance abuses by President Clinton, but Burton is not eager to take his own advice. Uh, they, re referencing Mr. Free and Mr. LaBella, have provided no support to the chairman in his effort to subpoena the memorandums which Reno declines to make public. Quote, on the contrary, they warn the committee away from a course they consider foolish and dangerous, end quote. The Tribune editorial goes on to say, Mr. Chairman, um, that in their view, Attorney General Reno deserves criticism for spurning the advice of the FBI director uh, and Mr. LaBella regarding the appointment of the special prosecutor, which they agree with you on. But they then go on to say, and I quote, but that does not justify Chairman Burton's demand. It would compromise the candid give and take an attorney general needs in dealing with her advisors. Even worse, as LaBella said, publication of the memos would be devastating to the investigation and would undercut what any prosecutor would do, whether an independent counsel or a Department of Justice prosecutor. The Tribune editorial closes by saying, and I quote, given their professed desire to see that the law is enforced, you would think Burton and his GOP colleagues would be leery of any step that might hinder prosecutors. Threat of contempt citation makes sense only if the real purpose is to embarrass the administration. And it is, I think, ironic in closing that you may run the risk of embarrassing the administration, or strike that, you may attempt to seek to admit, embarrass the administration, yet run the risk of jeopardizing the, inver the very investigation you, in particular, and this committee in general, has been so invested in. I yield back the balance yeah. of my time. Well, the time. gentleman yielded to me for a unanimous I consent will. request. I thank you very much. I, I had forgotten in my excitement of yielding to the chairman and ranking member. I would just like to ask unanimous consent to uh, insert into the record the editorial from the Cleveland dealer today, which also has discussed the subject. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Sununu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by uh, uh, responding uh, very briefly to the final points that was made, and that was the uh, to the suggestion that anyone is calling for the publication of these memos, for the public dissem dissemination of all of the information in these memos, uh, that's just plain wrong. No one is calling for that. What we're calling for in the subpoena is for the documents to be appropriately redacted, have sensitive information removed, to bring it to the chairman and the ranking member, perhaps 
uh, expose it to the executive committee, but those documents and that information would remain with the committee in, in uh, complete and appropriate secrecy. So the, the argument that uh, national publication would be a mistake is, uh, is a false argument at best. Uh, I want to begin uh, my formal remarks by emphasizing why we're here. The gentleman from Arizona pointed out that we're here, at least in part, because the existence of these memos and the conclusion of these two memos uh, were released or improperly released through leaks of the Justice Department itself. Uh, they, they have already been leaked, and in part we're here uh, because of those leaks. If they had been re retained as, as secret, uh, then I think uh, many people would argue we wouldn't need to be here today. Second, uh, the gravity of these memos and the gravity of the information that they contain. I think it can be summed up uh, very shortly in the remarks of Director Free uh, this week. When asked whether or not the, uh, the scope of the information and the scope of the facts uh, uh, drove him uh, directly to White House officials, senior administration officials, he said yes. When asked, asked Specifically, if the information in the memos dealt with the president and the vice president, he answered clearly and unequivocally, yes. Uh, he even continued that both the mandatory and the discretionary sections of the independent counsel statute uh, were in play here, meaning that there is a conflict of interest with the attorney general as well as uh, the existence of specific incredible evidence that may trigger the independent counsel statute. Uh, this is not uh, a, a, a matter to be taken lightly. It is a matter of the utmost uh, gravity. And given these facts, I believe the committee has a right to know, uh, has a right to the information. And moreover, the Attorney General has been given ample time to review both of these memos, uh, well over six months in the case of the memo from Director Free, and, uh, and o over three weeks in the case of the memo from Mr. Labella. In fact, I assume that members of the minority party were misspeaking today when they said all the Attorney General was asking for was three weeks, because the fact is what the Attorney General is asking for is three more weeks. She's already had three weeks to review uh, the 100-page memo, and while I understand that that's a serious task, given that this is probably the most important thing that the Attorney General is working on right now, I think three weeks to read the memo and uh, assimilate its details is perfectly reasonable. The essence of the Attorney General's failure, I think, is also adequately summed up by the uh, New York Times editorial of today that I'd like to read from. It, it reads in part, Charles Labella and Louis Free, the Justice Department's top authorities on campaign fundraising abuses, have now testified publicly that federal law requires the appointment of an independent counsel. The reason they explained is that the Attorney General, Janet Reno, has a conflict of interest that makes it impossible for her to supervise honestly an investigation of the man that appointed her. Moreover, the legal reasoning is correct and obvious to everyone but Ms. Reno. In conclusion, Ms. Reno has given the nation a politicized Justice Department. Mr. Free and Mr. LaBella have given her reports that instruct her in how to straighten out that department. Everyone in Washington knows what the law requires, end quote. It couldn't be more clear. Yes, General Reno does have the right to ignore the advice of her two, or in this case, three top investigators in this matter. After all, she is a political appointee. But she does have an obligation to provide this Congress with a summary of the evidence that she is choosing to ignore. It's a serious matter. We've dealt with a great deal of stonewalling and heard a great deal of rhetoric today. But no one can argue against this committee's right to subpoena these documents, and moreover, no one can argue against the fact that in this matter, no one, not the Attorney General or the President or the Vice President of the United States is above the law. This is a fundamental issue of the right of this committee and the right of Congress to exercise its oversight responsibility within the just, just Department of Justice. And in closing, it is worth repeating, in this matter or any other matter, no one is above the law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm sure that as the people of America look at this debate, and even as they involve themselves and inject themselves into it, they're kind of wondering 
When is it going to stop? Where does it all end? See, when the framers of the Constitution put together our government, they recognized, I'm sure, certain things. They recognized, first of all, the need for power, <laughs> the assignment of responsibility, and then the need for those who were assigned responsibilities to be accountable. I think it's very difficult to suggest in any way, shape, form, or fashion that the Attorney General has not been accountable, has been accountable professionally in terms of making sure and wanting to make sure to guard as zealously as she can the professionalism of her office, the professionalism of the work, the need for confidentiality in investigations and in the arrivement of rationale, the kind of logic that is used. You know, all of us get a great deal of advice. And I don't guess anybody has gotten more advice, Mr. Chairman, than probably you in the last several months. Everybody wants to advise and tell you and suggest what you want to do and what you ought to do. But one of the things that you've done is you've had the ability to sift through that advice and decide that no matter what anybody else was saying, you were going to do what you decided that you needed to do. And so has Janet Reno. She has received the advice of those who advise her. But she knows and understands that the bottom line, that the last level of decision, the last level of responsibility is hers. Now we've looked at information coming from editorial. We've looked at the advice of former attorney generals. And it's interesting that those in the profession, those who have been there, those who have walked in the moccasins, those who have sat at the desk, who have stood the ground, have said, you really ought not be going there, that we really should be listening to the Attorney General, and we really ought not be probing beyond where we need to go. When we start talking about contempt citations and calling into question the highest law enforcement officer of the land. There is a level of trust that we're beginning to give and suggest to the American people that we don't have. There is a level of trust that the American people are beginning to wonder about. I don't think anybody have to question Janet Reno in terms of her ability to withstand any possible intimidation. Someone raised the issue and raised the question the other day. Do you really think that Janet Reno will investigate her boss? Well, if you look at the record, she has not always demonstrated or suggested that she was on the same page as her boss. And so she has already demonstrated the ability not to be intimidated by the President of the United States, even though that is indeed her boss, just as she is demonstrating the ability not to be intimidated by this committee or by the chairman of this committee. She is a woman who is standing tall and standing firm even in the face of the most difficult of circumstances. Well, that's the kind of person that I would want to have 
go to bat for me. That's the kind of person that I would want to have sift through the information. That's the kind of person that I would want to put some confidence and trust in to believe that she will interpret the law of the land and that she will follow that law, not kowtowing to anybody, not even the President of the United States. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would certainly hope that we would follow our Chief Law Enforcement Officer, because I think she'll stand for the American people. I thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, following Mr. Davis, I want you to know that I have the greatest respect for the minority and what they are talking about today as it relates to uh, understanding and appreciating the, the job that uh, the Attorney General has. Perhaps no argument uh, that we could make today would uh, turn any member of the committee in the minority. Uh, since I've been on this committee now as a freshman for a year and a half, I've seen this committee uh, vigorously uh, attack Newt Gingrich. Uh, as a matter of fact, we spent the first few months, month and a half that we were here attacking our speaker. Uh, vehemently and bitterly, uh, the speaker told the truth, went through his day in court, paid a $300,000 fine, and yet now for this year and a half, we have been facing with this attorney general, with this FBI director, uh, and this minority, uh, a fight about the president of the United States. This president is not forthright in wanting to talk about this. Our investigators, and even so FBI investigators, every time they turn a corner, they are faced with defense lawyers and investigators hired by the president to try and not only obstruct justice, but to delay the investigation that is going on. FBI Director Louis Free very plainly and carefully said that since late 1996, he has personally discussed with the Attorney General of the United States the need and building the case based upon evidence why an independent counsel should be appointed. While talking to this committee, FBI Director Louis Free said it clearly in, in, publicly includes, he said, the president and the vice president in a group that may have violated criminal law. I can't imagine any reasonable person, nor the Attorney General of the United States, under any scenario, not wanting to give that to an independent person. I happen to come from a family that does believe in the rule of law. It was my father, FBI Director William Sessions, who was summarily fired by Bill Clinton for supposed one violation that had been cleared by his boss, the Attorney General, in the building of a fence, a $10,000 fence. And this administration continues to stand up and talk about how they do not have to comply with what we do, and they're above the law. I would tell you I believe that the Attorney General of the United States cannot make a decision. The best advice that she's been given by the FBI director for over two years, up to two years, has been completely ignored. And she acts like she's dealing with the law in a different way than what they are. I think that's wrong. I think she does have to follow a norm. I think she should have to comply. I think that any normal and regular person would realize, as the FBI director has when he concluded, that what she needs to do is to, end, is to clearly appoint an independent prosecutor in this case. I think any reasonable conclusion would go that direction. 
The problem is now we're having to, in a political way, make a decision about how we're going to vote. I think it's very confusing to the American public about this. I think it's a sad day when this happens. And I will reiterate, back in 1974, President Nixon's own party stood up and said, we believe there have been violations of the Constitution and violations of the law. They are the people that made start to finish Watergate 14 months. They are the people who stood up and said, let the facts lead to the truth, and the truth lead to the facts. And I am deeply disappointed that our colleagues today, not one person will stand up and say, let's get this thing over with, and encourage the President of the United States to be truthful and come forward with the truth. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that uh, I be allowed to submit into the record uh, article today from uh, that is entitled Campaign Finance Parallel Probes, uh, and insert that in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tierney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I believe that people will try to be reasonable when they review what we're doing here today, and so I want to bring it back a bit, step back to just what it is that this committee is addressing, and that is whether or not we ought to find the Attorney General of the United States in contempt. People will look at this and see that the Attorney General has not been contemptuous in her response to this committee or the Chairman, instead has said that she would like two weeks in which to review the advice of those people that work for her and who reasonably can be expected to give her advice with respect to what might be in the memorandum that was presented by Mr. LaBella and the one by Mr. Free. Now, Mr. Hastert earlier spoke about common sense and mentioned that he wasn't a lawyer for those of us that are lawyers and that uh, may have spent some time before judges that periodically look at the issue of contempt, before they find somebody in contempt, they generally try to look at their conduct. And in this instance, I presume, would look at the Attorney General saying, I need two weeks to be advised by those people that the United States taxpayers pay to advise me on matters exactly such as this. Then they would look at the exigencies of the situation and try to determine whether or not there was some crisis that was involved that would warrant the denial of that two weeks for that function to be carried out. I suggest that there is no exigency in this situation, that it would be less than reasonable to say that the Attorney General, she couldn't have that two weeks. And then at the end of that two weeks, if she didn't produce the conference that she says she will produce to the ranking member and to the chairman and to others, the Senator Hatch and Congressman Hyde, and didn't come forth and review with them the materials that are in front of her and her opinions on that, that that would be the proper time to look and see whether or not a situation for contempt existed in that uh, era. And I think the reasonableness behind her request, as any person sitting in judgment on that, would be buttressed by the fact that the head of the FBI and the lead investigator and the person in charge of the task force all say that we believe that it would be harmful at this point in time to release that memorandum. In fact, Ms. LaBella says he thinks it would be harmful in general to ever do it uh, because it would interfere and put at risk the fruits of all the work that they've done so far. And I think we should be mindful of that, uh, particularly in this situation. Step back, take a look at it in that context and judge the reasonableness of what we're doing. You know, there has a serious difficulty with trying to draw conclusions. There were a number of so-called precedents that the majority put forth for this type. And I would just say that in each of those incidents, in the Palmer Raids investigation, the trial on that matter had ended before any prosecution mem memorandum was reviewed. In the Teapo Teapot Dome scandal, there was not a prosecution memorandum, but a report of an accountant working on the investigation. In the white collar crime in the oil industry, the Department of Justice did not turn over documents related to an open criminal case in that matter. The Gorsuch EPA investigation, those documents were documents generated by the EPA relative to a civil enforcement of a Superfund statute. In the Iran-Contra matter, they were not part of any criminal investigation. The review was completed before any criminal investigation had begun. In the Rocky Flats case and other environmental crimes cases, both of those instances involved cases that were closed, already closed at the time the Department of Justice produced records, and in fact, the investigations were about determining whether or not the Department of Justice had properly decided the cases were closed. And in the Watergate reference, the Department of Justice, it is even alleged that they turned over documents related to any ongoing criminal investigation during Watergate. 
So I think those are instructive differences in the situation here, where you have the head of the FBI, the head of the, the uh, particular investigation, and the head of the crime task force saying, this is not an appropriate situation or time to be producing that. And this committee does not have a stellar reputation of keeping things from the public that it ought to keep from the public. We have instance after instance, and I would ask uh, unanimous consent to put into the record the history of the committee leaks uh, that have existed out of here. And it is, as Mr. Shattuck wanted to say, that the Attorney General had to bear responsibility for leaks that happened on her watch. It's amazing that this committee doesn't require that our chairperson have any responsibility for leaks that were committed during his watch. Uh, but suffice it to say that we're talking here about a simple request for two weeks upon which a determination would be made and the appropriate people will be briefed about what was in the memoranda and what the decision is going to be. <clears throat> if we're talking about contempt, the reasonableness of that request has to be reviewed. Clearly, when you look at the advice of the head of the FBI, the lead investigator, the task force individual saying that that's reasonable, that it would be harmful to release it to this committee before then, I think the contempt is certainly inappropriate. We get way out in front of ourselves on this, and reasonable people, lawyers and non-lawyers judging this, will think that we've been precipitous in our action and doing harm to the committee's re reputation and to the process here. And I would suggest that we, uh, we not take that particular kind of action at this time. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Snowbarger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to follow up on some comments that our colleague, uh, Mr. Davis from Illinois, mentioned earlier about trust. I think that's exactly what this is all about. Uh, and the question is very, very simple. Uh, the Attorney General has received advice from the uh, head of the FBI. She's also received advice from her own uh, appointee, uh, the uh, head of the task force, uh, looking into these uh, incidents. Both of them have indicated that a special or uh, independent uh, counsel ought to be appointed. Uh, for some reason or other, the uh, Attorney General has been resisting that. And I think that calls uh, trust into question. Uh, I think the committee can only be asked to uh, uh, follow the advice, uh, trust me, uh, for so long. And I think if we'd had a little more cooperation throughout the process, we wouldn't be in this situation. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield to my colleague, Mr. Barr. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, frequently in these sorts of matters, it uh, can be somewhat instructive to spend a couple of moments uh, talking not so much about what is before us as what is not before us. Uh, this hearing today, uh, this uh, proceeding today, is not about the director of the FBI, Louis Pree. It is not about the former head of the Attorney General's own task force investigating these matters, Mr. Charles Labella. They have done their jobs, and I have every confidence that the director of the FBI will continue to do his job and to uphold his oath of office. That's not at issue here. I have every confidence that Mr. Labella, wherever his career takes him, now that the current promotion to U.S. Attorney, which uh, certainly seemed appropriate before he made his recommendation based on the laws he sought, has now been taken from him, will continue to do his job. These are both honorable men. This matter today is not about either of them. We are doing our job here in the Congress. Whether members on the other side like it or not, we have a job to do. They can choose to ignore the rules of the House that provide that we have oversight responsibility to see that the laws are, in fact, faithfully executed by officers of the executive branch. And that's fine. Let them just go home, absolves themselves of that responsibility. The fact of the matter remains, though, that we have a job to do, and that is an oversight responsibility on behalf of the American people. This contempt matter before this panel today is about the Attorney General, the Attorney General of the United States. She is the one that has failed to do her job, not Mr. Free, not Mr. Labella, not the chairman of this committee. It is the Attorney General who is failing to follow the law, failing to see that the laws be faithfully executed according to the oath of office that she took. That oath of office did not say, I will faithfully execute some of the laws. It did not say, I will faithfully execute the laws some of the time. It did not say, I will faithfully execute some parts of some laws. It is an absolute mandate on the Attorney General to see that the laws be faithfully executed. That includes the law that establishes the independent counsel. 
One of the provisions of that independent counsel law, passed by the Congress, signed by the President of the United States, and embodied in the laws of this country, directs and mandates that the Attorney General seek the appointment of an independent counsel if there is substantial and credible evidence that a covered person, which includes, despite the sophistry on the other side, the President and Vice President very clearly, may have violated a federal law. This is not discretionary. This is not a law as to which the Attorney General can decide for policy reasons or political reasons or any reasons that she is not going to seek the appointment of an independent counsel. The law places that mandate on her when the evidence is there. She must do so. We have the Director of the FBI and the head of the Attorney General's own task force that have now stated absolutely unequivocally that there is substantial and credible evidence that covered persons have violated the law. At this point in time, the Attorney General has no discretion. The only course of action open to her, if she is to uphold her oath of office to see that the laws be faithfully executed, is to seek the appointment of an independent counsel. She has no discretion in this matter. If the other side wants her to have discretion, let them propose an amendment to the independent counsel statute and let them try and make it retroactive. In the absence of that, all of the words on the other side aside, everything else aside, the fact of the matter is that statutory mandate has been triggered. Thus, we are now faced with the situation of a statute directing that the Attorney General take certain action. She is failing to do so. She is refusing to do so. That brings into question, that brings to the fore, the oversight responsibility of this committee. That is what brings us here today. Whether or not the laws of this land are being fully and faithfully executed by not just any officer of the executive branch, but the officer of the executive branch with ultimate responsibility to see that those laws be fully and faithfully executed. Now we hear from the folks on the other side, the defenders of this administration, that we should feel guilty, and I will go in, uh, in my time into why we should not. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders passes. Okay. Uh, then we'll go to uh, Mr. Barr. Thank you. The other side is here today to try and make us, those of us on this committee who are seeking to fulfill our responsibility, the same, in the same way that the Attorney General should be fulfilling hers to make us feel guilty about this. Well, it just won't work. Now, let's talk about what's in this memo, the LaBella memo, and also the memo that we discussed previously by the Director of the FBI. According to the subpoena itself, and I would ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that the subpoena dated July 24th of 1998, directed to the Attorney General and the attachment there to Schedule A be included in the record. That's what you said. Uh, with, uh, I ask unanimous consent that the subpoena itself be included in the record. Without objection. The terms of this subpoena itself make very clear we are not asking for sensitive material. We specifically ask that the sensitive material be redacted. For those on the other side who don't understand what that term means, it means taken out. We don't want it in there. We don't want it in there because it would be improper to do so, and we do not want the sensitive material in there that might compromise an investigation. That is a bogus issue. That is a red herring. We also know from the testimony of the director of the FBI what this document represents is not a prosecution memo. Prosecution memos, as I, as a former United States attorney, are very familiar, are very lengthy documents. They are very detailed documents with, uh, with uh, evidence in or, or testimony and, and, and material in there that relates to what witnesses will testify to, the way the witnesses will be used. That clearly would provide an improp improperly provide a roadmap that would not be appropriate for us to need in our oversight capacity. We have asked for the sensitive information to be taken out. I respect the, the views of the director of the FBI and the head of the task force. They believe that there is sensitive material in there. They have done their job. They are doing their job. We have our job to do. We are not asking for sensitive material. The material that would provide the roadmap in a case like this would be 6E material. That is grand jury material. 
We are specifically asking that that not be in there. It will not be in there because that would be improper. We therefore have brushed aside the red herrings in this case, and there are many. What we're left with is simply the question as follows. Shall the Attorney General of this land abide by the rule of law, fulfill her oath of office to see that the laws be faithfully and fully executed in light of the fact that a mandatory provision of a United States law which directs her to take certain action, having been triggered, she refuses to do so. That refusal is within the clear oversight jurisdiction of this committee to inquire into. In order for us to properly inquire into it, in order for us to properly carry out our oath of office, because on this side, we take an oath of office seriously, in order for us to carry that out, we have asked for, pursuant to the rule of law, by subpoena, duly issued by this committee, directing that the Attorney General provide these two memos for us, properly redacted. That is, again, for my colleagues who don't understand that term, the sensitive material taken out. The, the FBI director said yesterday, in response to a direct question, he was not advising the Attorney General not to comply with the subpoena. And that is very appropriate for him to say, because he knows there is no legal reason for the Attorney General to refuse to comply with the subpoena. There are only two grounds on which a valid refusal could lie. One is, this committee has no jurisdiction. That issue has not even been raised, even by the other side. They haven't tried that red herring. That's too red even for them. The only other ground on which, on which a proper refusal would lie would be a claim of executive privilege. That claim has not been made in this case. Indeed, it cannot be made in this case. It has not been made. Therefore, we are left with a situation where there is no legal basis whatsoever for the Attorney General to refuse to comply with this subpoena. There may be policy reasons that some people think are appropriate, but that is not a legal reason. It is our job on this committee to weigh all of the evidence, to look at those policy reasons, to brush those aside which do not have merit, to pay close attention to those that, will, that do, to take proper precautions, as the gentleman from Arizona has very clearly stated, we will and we have. And I would ask our colleagues on the other side to also commit here today, as we will, that simply because this material is given to us and our oversight responsibility does not mean that it will be made public and we will not do so. Mr. Chairman, I commend you for having the courage to stand up for the rule of law, even though others will not, and to demand that the Attorney General, as popular as she might be, also must be held to abide by the rule of law. This is an appropriate circumstance for this contempt, contempt citation to issue. I support it, and I believe the American people will too. I thank the chairman and yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I guess Mr. Sanders now wants his time. Well, Sanders. what I want to do is, is yield to Mr. Barrett, if I might, Mr. Chairman. May yield. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. I just I want to make a, a relatively brief point. Um, just last evening on the floor of the House of Representatives, we debated a provision that was included in the appropriations bill um, that was uh, a debate that included some, some high emotions because it was a feeling by some members of, of Congress that certain other members had been unfairly targeted for prosecution. So the amendment, in essence, put out some criteria that the Attorney General was to set forth for prosecutors, um, rules of ethics, and set up a procedure where uh, someone who felt that they had been wrong could file a complaint with the Attorney General's office. But if the Attorney General did not give um, adequate, uh, an adequate remedy, as that person felt, there was a, a new board created, an outside board, um, composed of three individuals appointed by the President. Now, during the course of that debate, um, there, was a, there was a motion and an amendment to strike that provision. Um, and the fight was led by the only, as I understand it, the only three U.S. Uh, attorneys, former U.S. attorneys, who are members of Congress. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson from Arkansas, uh, Mr. Bryan from Tennessee, and Mr. Barr from Georgia. And during the course of that debate, Mr. Barr made the, f the following statement that I'm, I'm going to quote from him. Also, Title VIII would, al would allow an outside panel not composed of prosecutors, to have full access to every bit of the prosecutor's case. 
that would be outrageous and it would in effect stop important prosecutions now when mr labella described his opposition to releasing this information he did not use the word outrageous but he did use the word devastating and i think in this context they probably have pretty much the same the same meaning um, i agreed with that amendment i agreed with mr barr at that time mr hutchinson and mr bryant um, that we should not turn over important elements of the government's case to an outside body. That was about 20 hours ago. Um, today we're in essence facing the same question. Um, and I would hope that those members of the other side um, who supported the language that's been supported by the U.S. attorneys throughout this country, the FBI, the district attorneys, um, would do the same in this case. Because it does set a dangerous precedent when you allow uh, a prosecutor's <laughs> case to be turned over to an outside body. What it does, and, and this is where uh, uh, Mr. Free um, talked about basically setting out the roadmap, um, and that this was not something that it should be done um, because it's gonna hamper the investig investigation process. So again, I would ask, and I guess I would ask in particular the, the authors of that amendment um, to be consistent, philosophically consistent, um, so that we could move forward in, a, in an expeditious manner. And Gentlemen I would yield, yield to Mr. Waxman. <clears throat> I just want to point out, uh, Mr. Barr was explaining very carefully what uh, redact means, how you remove certain names and identities, uh, and suggesting that be done with this memo. But Director Free and Mr. Labella told us very clearly they didn't see how they could redact information that would jeopardize their investigation and their prosecution. They didn't think it could be done because it wasn't just specific information, but uh, the theory of the case. And I, and I do believe that Director Free and, and Mr. Labella understand what redact means. And they told us that they didn't see it could be done in a way that uh, would protect the security of those documents. I, I want to also, if the gentleman would permit, uh, since he has another minute or so uh, left, there's some people have asked me, is this unusual to have the Justice Department refuse to turn over investigative documents? There has been over a hundred years of precedent on this very subject. Since the beginning of this century, Justice Departments under both Democratic and Republican administrations refused to turn over to Congress the type of materials that we're talking about today. Uh, in Franklin Roosevelt's administration, it was Attorney General Robert Jackson and he refused to provide information stating, quote, all investigative reports are confidential documents of the executive department of the government and congressional or public access to them would not be in the public interest, end quote. In the Eisenhower administration, the same thing, department policy does not permit disclosure of staff memoranda or recommendations. And we had the statement very clearly from the uh, Reagan administration where Mr. Cooper said, the policy of not turning over investigative materials was first expressed by President Washington, has been reaffirmed by or on behalf of most of our presidents, and he went through Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, Roosevelt, both Roosevelt's, Eisenhower, and he said the same thing was gonna be true of the Reagan administration. So Attorney General Reno stands on a long precedent for good reason. We don't wanna jeopardize investigative uh, matters. There's not a single case where the information from an ongoing investigation has ever been turned over to Congress. Our request is unreasonable, and to hold her in contempt is uh, unreasonable as well. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'm a new member on this committee, and I, uh, I'd like to make some ob observations of, of what I've seen uh, with the three or four times that I've had the, the pleasure of being here. Uh, if I was listening to the, the other side um, and uh, really uh, wanted to know what this committee was all about, I, I, I wouldn't know that it's an oversight committee. Uh, and the gentleman that talked about an outside panel, I think we're a little more than an outside panel. I think we are the Government Reform and Oversight Committee with the responsibility of oversight of situations just as we're dealing with here today. And what I've, I've noticed on the other side of the aisle 
is that there have been no probing questions investigating campaign finance violations. Where are the questions? Mr. Davis asked a little while ago, when will this end? Well, I hope it will not end until we get the truth. I think that's the object of what we're all about here, is to get to the truth. And what I have heard from the other side has been a continuing trashing of the chairman, ridiculing this committee. Um, Mr. Waxman started out by ridiculing uh, the committee and trashing the chairman. I'm on two other committees, Agriculture Committee and National Security, and I have not seen the kind of uh, disrespect for a chairman in those other two committees. We've worked together pretty well. But I don't see any uh, responsibility uh, of the, on the other side to working in a bipartisan way. But I don't think the chairman should really feel too lonely uh, in, uh, in being attacked the way he has been attacked and in the, the mean-spirited way that I've, I've noticed that he has been attacked. Because I think he, he certainly uh, would, um, would be part of a, a long list of, of folks, of individuals that have uh, dared to challenge this administration on the truth. Uh, you look down the list, Billy Dale, Gene Lewis, uh, Judge Hale, uh, Gary Aldrich, Kathleen Willey, Paula Jones, uh, Linda Tripp, uh, Senator Al D'Amato, Fred Thompson, Chairman Bill Klinger, uh, Chairman Jim Leach, and others and others and others. Uh, <clears throat> if, I, uh, if I wanted to indulge in uh, weird and uh, paranoid theories, and I didn't know any better, I would think uh, that maybe there's a vast left-wing conspiracy, go conspiracy going on. But my question here today is, is when? When will some Democrat with the intestinal fortitude stand up as Howard Baker stood up in Watergate and ask for the truth? When is that going to happen? When are, they going, when are you going to uphold your constitutional responsibility to ask for the truth and stop playing p political games? This committee is about trying to get to the truth. I hope. I hope that's what it's about. But Mr. Davis asked, when will it end? Well, I hope it will not end until we get to the truth and we do our oversight responsibilities, what we are required to do as members of this committee. And I think it's absolutely outrageous what I have seen out of the minority in this committee to continually, continually to attack the chairman and to talk about political, political games and politics and all this. Let's just get to the truth and let the truth, let the chips fall where they may, and then we can move on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. Uh, I think that's all of our members that have uh, spoken. Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. Would you state your unanimous uh, consent Mr. request? Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record uh, two articles, one from the Wall Street Journal, uh, August uh, 3rd, uh, 1998, one from the uh, New York Times, and that's uh, July 16th, 1998, they contain the same information okay. that was provided or leaked to the media, uh, but this committee of Congress well, cannot obtain firsthand. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A few points I want to make before we uh, close the debate and go to the vote, and I know the chairman's going to follow me. What compelling reason is there for a contempt at the moment? Why can't we wait for a few weeks? Are these documents the kind of documents that ought to be turned over? Who, who is supporting the uh, imposition of uh, a uh, sanction against the Attorney General? I have a chart on the side there. Those who feel it's compelling that we act today and not wait, hold the Attorney General in contempt. We have the Chairman and maybe all the Republican members, I suppose, that we'll have all of them voting for it. But I do want to point out 
that urging that we not take this action is the director of the FBI, Louis Free, the chief uh, prosecutor on campaign finance abuses, Charles Labella, the Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno, the Senate Chairman of the, fin of the Judiciary Committee, a Republican, Orrin Hatch. We contacted uh, the former Attorneys General, and we heard from three. Now, there are only three that we heard from. The Chairman said he had heard from others, but we, and it's not disclosed who he heard from, but we heard from uh, Nicholas Katzenbach, Ramsey Clark, and um, uh, Griffin Bell. We have uh, James DeSarno, who's the FBI agent in charge of this investigation. We have editorials from all over the country. They've all said, don't take this step of holding an attorney general in contempt. Don't do it. It's not the right thing to do. And I would hope that that bipartisan list would influence some of our colleagues. We've heard accusations. Uh, and I, I, I think that uh, we ought to recognize that when accusations are made, we ought to have some evidence for the, those kinds of statements. And we heard the very uh, outrageous accusation that was not substantiated, that it was the Justice Department that leaked the fact of the LaBella memo. If someone has proof of that, they ought to come forward with it. Otherwise, to make that statement as if it were a statement of fact without any evidence to support it is, a, is a, uh, a, 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 an outrageous thing uh, to do. The fact is that um, none of the situation that we're now dealing with is the Attorney General's fault. Uh, Mr. La Tourette said, why don't we get the chairman and the ranking member together to work something out? The Attorney General has tried. She met with us privately last Friday. She tried to uh, in a, get a conference call last night. She even wanted to come and talk to the members of this committee personally at our hearing, and she was refused that opportunity. She's suggested everything she can think of not to get to a situation where the law enforcement activities are jeopardized, and she's been spurned. She's now courageously saying she would rather face contempt than allow the Justice Department's criminal investigation to be compromised. She's saying she would be willing to go to jail before she would allow members of Congress to interject themselves in prosecutorial decisions. We should all want to keep Congress out of prosecutorial decisions, yet the chairman is trying to read confidential prosecution memos before the Attorney General makes her decision. He's trying to politicize decisions in criminal cases. I know my Republican friends believe they will, uh, they will be a uh, permanent majority, but I want to tell you, it doesn't always work out the way you'd like it to. I said it before and I'll say it again, be careful of the precedents you set. There is not a member on the Republican side who would support me if I were chairman and I tried to get prosecutorial information that Ken Starr had from people working for him. Our principles should rise above the circumstances of the day. Uh, our, at our last meeting, the chairman claimed three previous attorneys general supported his position. I, I don't know how to respond to that because we've never seen anything from them, nor were their names even disclosed. Uh, as you vote today, remember this, the attorney general and all these others uh, are asking for time not to have this issue come to this kind of conclusion. We ought to be as gentlemanly and, as uh, Senator Orrin Hatch in, and uh, in his statement, uh, Congressman Hyde, in extending her that, uh, that uh, opportunity to come and brief us on the memo after she has made her decision. I urge my colleagues, do not vote for this. Don't even put it to a vote. Let's not uh, rush to a judgment that we could uh, avoid a confrontation that's unnecessary. I urge a no vote on this motion. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Let me just make a couple of comments and then I'll yield to Mr. Cox for some concluding remarks. Wait a second, wait a second. You, you, Mr. Chairman, I, if you, you, you told me that you and I were going to be the closing speakers, are you going to yield part of your time? Part of my time. Oh, forgive me for jumping all over. Start the clock over again, please. Let me just make a couple of comments, and I'll yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Cox. First of all, uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts uh, wanted to enter into the record some uh, indications that we have had leaks. We will enter those into the record, but I would like also to ask unanimous consent that we enter into the record the facts as we see them, because we don't believe there have been any leaks by the committee. Second, 
Mr. Hyde, who's been mentioned many times, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, is totally supportive of the actions that we're taking today and totally supportive of the actions of this committee. If you don't believe it, call Mr. Hyde. The, the documents that we're requesting are not for public consumption. They're for the committee only, and we will work diligently to make sure that none of those are made public. There is a precedent for our request, many precedents. And as I stated before, they go all the way back to the Teapot Dome scandal, and that's been beaten up on uh, several times already. The subpoena excludes six e-material grand jury testimony. We said that we will work with them to make sure that nothing that's going to imperil the investigations will uh, be, we, will be uh, uh, put in the public domain, and we mean that. Uh, the mandatory part of the law has been triggered. And uh, as an oversight committee, we have the right to know why the top law enforcement agents who have been working on this have given to the, the Attorney General their recommendation that the mandatory part has been triggered and that she, should, she has to appoint an independent counsel. And if she's recalcitrant, we as the Oversight Committee need to know why she's taking that view. And if she is taking that view and violating, violating the law, she needs to be held accountable. Now, it has been stated that uh, we don't know that the Justice Department was responsible for these leaks. Before this committee, Mr. LaBella, said that only three copies of his memo were given out, one to the Attorney General and one to the FBI Director. The Attorney General made nine copies, and she had meetings that Mr. LaBella and Mr. Free didn't even know about with other people, including political appointees made by the President. It's logical to assume they got one of those nine documents. Therein, I believe, is the source of the leaks. Now, you may differ with that, but it did come from the Justice Department of the United States. I'd like to point out one more time about leaks. I'd like to show real briefly on the television screen what Mr. Uh, Free said, Director Free said about leaks by this committee yesterday, or day before yesterday. I'd also like to thank the committee, uh, everyone on the committee and your staff for handling a lot of the very sensitive and classified information that we've provided to you over the last few months, and particularly uh, the briefing which uh, provided, summarized the memo at issue, at least myself and the Attorney General. I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Waxman, for the very confidential way in which that was handled, and appreciate that very much. For, for those of you who couldn't hear that, are, are, are you guys messing with the wires? <laughs> you know, none of, yours, none of yours were messed up. The only one I asked for was messed up. I've got to check this out. I got to tell you, these guys really have the inside track. Anyhow, he said that we had kept his confidence, and we did it uh, in, in in a very, uh, uh, pro, uh, very uh, uh, confidential way, and he congratulated both Mr. Waxman and I on that, and the committee. So uh, we'll try to make that clear next time, Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see that our members have returned, and uh, on both sides, and and I won't long. We should be mindful of precedents uh, that exist and abide by them. We should be mindful of the precedents that we set. In the past, there have been Democratic Congresses and Republican administrations. In the future, there will be presumably uh, Republican administrations and Democratic Congresses. I don't believe today that we should vote for contempt. If a number of things had not occurred. If, for example, the Justice Department itself had not leaked this memorandum, if uh, this committee were asking for grand jury material, for so-called 6E material, which uh, the House Judiciary Committee uh, was able to obtain in the Watergate uh, matter where uh, they even obtained grand jury testimony, uh, but we're not seeking that. Uh, if we we're uh, requesting this material, but unwilling to treat it as executive session material so that it would remain secret. But we are, in <coughs> fact, uh, proposing that it remain executive session material. Uh, if the Justice Department had at least partially complied with the subpoena, but they have not at all, uh, if the Attorney General had even discussed the contents of this memorandum, urging an independent counsel and finding her in violation of the law with the people who wrote it, with uh, Mr. LaBella or with the FBI director, or if 
the Attorney General had done what is necessary in order legally to resist the subpoena, which is to claim executive privilege. But as we heard testimony under oath from the FBI Director and Mr. LaBella, uh, even the incipient steps to begin that have not yet taken place. The deadline on this subpoena expired nearly three weeks ago on July 27th. The Attorney General is in violation, she is in contempt, and we should so vote her. The gentleman yield for a question. The, the all time has expired. Mr. Chairman, may I ask unanimous consent request to put into the record a statement by Attorney General Richard Kleindeist in opposition to this contempt uh, citation? Without objection, so ordered. All time has expired. The question now comes on the contempt report itself. All in favor will indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. A roll call vote has been requested and will be granted. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? Aye. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Aye. Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Ms. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes aye. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes aye. Mr. S Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Lewis? Mr. Lewis votes aye. <coughs> Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? No. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise? Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? No. Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Condent? Mr. Condent votes no. Mr. Sanders? No. Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Begloyevich? Mr. Begloyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? Mr. Ford? Mr. Ford votes no. Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Allen? The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 24 oh, ayes. One, 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 we have one more vote. Mr. Davis? Is that it? The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 24 ayes and 19 nays. The Mr. report uh, has been agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent for members to have seven days to file supplemental minority or additional views to the committee report. Uh, we would like to have that amended so that it applies both to the minority and the majority. Are you talking about legislative or calendar days, uh, Mr. Waxman? I I've asked for uh, seven days to seven, file. Seven calendar days. Views. Without objection, so ordered. I move that uh, I transmit the report as adopted for filing as a privilege report to the full House. 
All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed to the motion will signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it and the motion is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to point out for the record that Mr. Allen from the state of Maine uh, is managing the bill on the floor and was unable to be here for the vote. That will be inserted in the record. Without objection, the staff is authorized to make necessary technical and conforming changes to the report as agreed to and without objection so ordered. This meeting stands adjourned. About an hour and a half after the House Committee's vote, Attorney General Janet Reno met briefly with reporters at the Justice Department. Here's her reaction.